Uh, Morena Koto, good morning everyone. Welcome to this morning's uh, Kaipara District Council Externally Funded Projects Committee meeting. Uh, we are coming at you live on the 20th of April 2022 and this committee is a committee of the whole of Kaipara District Council. Uh, but of course it is dealing with uh, many millions of dollars of very important projects which are funded by external government uh, funding sources. So uh, this is a very important committee for this council. Uh, at this point, I would like Councillor uh, Anna Kerno, our Deputy Mayor, to please open uh, today's committee meeting with a karakia. Thank you. Kia hora te marano, kia whakapapa po namu te moana. He huarahi mā tato i te rangi nei, aroha atu, aroha mai, tato i a tato katoa. Kia ora. Thank you. Uh, at this point, I'm calling for apologies, and I'm seeing that uh, everyone is present except Councillor David Wills at this point. So, uh, Tracy, have we received any apologies here? Uh, I haven't. I will quickly check again. Sorry, one moment. Just in case. So it's a few late arrivals today. No, no apologies. Wish okay, it. thank you. Thank you. No apologies. Right. Uh, so uh, we'll move on to item number 1.3 of today, which is the confirmation of the agenda. So I would like to move the uh, agenda as uh, uh, sent uh, be uh, received and adopted for today's meeting. I'm seeking a second for that. Uh, Councillor Aaron Wilson Collins, thank you for seconding that. Is there any commentary about the agenda? No commentary, thank you. So we're putting this to the vote now. All those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Against. That is uh, confirmed. The agenda is confirmed for today's meeting. Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, item number 1.4 today, conflict of interest declaration. Uh, Councillors, are there any conflicts of interest uh, with today's agenda? No conflicts of interest. That makes it very simple. Thank you. Uh, we shall move on now to section two of today's agenda, which is the minutes of the last externally funded projects committee meeting, uh, which is, dates from the 16th of March. That was when that meeting took place. So we have uh, the, the minutes here uh, to be confirmed and uh, uh, sorry, and at this point, uh, Councillor uh, Wills has arrived and joined the meeting. Thank you, Tracy, if you could take note of that. Thank you. Uh, so at this point, uh, regarding the confirmation of the minutes, I'm happy to uh, move these as a true and accurate record of that meeting. And I'm seeking a second for that. Councillor Erin Wilson-Collins, thank you. Uh, that puts it onto the table. Elected members, are there any comment, uh, comments or commentary regarding the minutes of the 16th of March externally funded projects committee meeting? No commentary, thank you. Right, so we're putting this to the vote now uh, for these to be a, recorded as a true and accurate record. Uh, all those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Against. Carried. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Let's move on with the uh, subjects and the and the the good fun with our, our actual external funded projects for today. Uh, and the first of these is the Kai Water Kai Irrigation uh, Project, uh, which is uh, and uh, which is uh, managed for us by uh, North Saint Inc. And so uh, I'm seeking someone to please uh, move the noting of this report. Councillor Anna Kerno, thank you for moving that. And a seconder here, please. 
Councillor Karen Joyce Pucky, thank you, puts it onto the table for us. Thank you. So at this point, I would invite uh, Vaughan Cooper and Greg Hall from uh, Northland Inc, please, to uh, conduct your presentation for us. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Your Worship and Councillors. I, I did wonder if I understood Eros maybe wanted to make some opening remarks first. Um, whether he wants to or not, otherwise we can crack on. We are ready, but. Uh, Eros, um, bonjour. Uh, I was just making sure so the status report has been taken as read, the one we prepare and is attached to the minute. And yeah, just leaving uh, the presentation to Greg and Vaughan. Uh, will take us through what is happening on site and especially the learnings and what is next. So over to you, Vaughan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, more than everybody, um, I, I'm not going to say much. I'm going to hand to Greg and, and maybe just quickly just to note, hopefully you all know Jeanette who's sitting in the room with Greg as well. So um, Jeanette helps um, work in this project as well. But but we're just going to run you through a presentation, um, mainly photos and things to give you a bit of an update on what's going on. Not sure, maybe just check. Um, Mia, would you like to take questions as we go? Or would you want to hold them to the end? Uh, so I think it would be good if we could do questions as we go, uh, because then there'll be kind of current and it will keep 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 the presentation in total rolling along. Thank you. Yeah, great. So we'll hand over to Greg and Jeanette who can um, light up the presentation. Away we go. Good morning, worship and councillors. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Hopefully everybody can see that. No. no. Not coming through yet, Greg. Hopefully now. Yes, now. Awesome. Okay, so this is the Kaipi Water Demonstration for Science. Um, so the Kai Water, water plays a key part in transforming land use. Building on the Kaipa Kai and the Kaipa Water Project further supports the valuable uh, Kai opportunities in the region. So demonstration site one is the Te Ora Iwi land at Mongaroo Bluff, just north of Dougal, showcasing an irrigation that can easily scale up and down, uh, depending on what crops are being watered at the time. Demonstration site two is in Tokopru, so a centre pivot irrigator has been installed, which spans 242 metres and can irrigate roughly about 10 hectares, or two hectares uh, are in the project. And our uh, contract for Northland Link is from June 21 through to May 23. Site 1 will deal with first at Monganui Bluff. So the site includes an in-ground irrigation system, which could be remotely managed via the web uh, to deliver water to the crops at precise amounts, both and below is of the water source on the property. Um, and this, this has never dried up, even in the drought seasons. So this is the Te Ora Aranga Coast Road site. This is the uh, just around about 6, well, 0.06 hectares of uh, arable area. We did note uh, when we cultivated this area, there is a uh, natural spring in the middle, which we couldn't cultivate because it was a little bit too wet for the trucks. Uh, so we had to avoid that area in the middle. So the crops we selected uh, were yam, uh, New Zealand yam, sweet corn, watermelon and kamakama. So this uh, photo here is the uh, irrigation outlet, so the hydrant head outlet, which goes into a white tape. Uh, then the uh, elbow joints are attached to that, and then the drip, drip lines are attached to that. This is the irrigation rolled out down the yams um, and uh, in action with some drips. Uh, we also had some sensor probes in the ground, which uh, measured the moisture. So we could uh, adjust the irrigation as needed, and also the temperature and moisture as well across the crops. A planting day, so we planted all four crops, uh, and we're really thankful for, to uh, Te Ora supplying 30 volunteers for this. Uh, they knocked out planting four crops in uh, just over just over three hours. Uh, here they are planting the yams by hand um, with a pinch of some sweet corn seed. So we had really good crop growth to begin with. Uh, so the sweet corn took off really, really well. Uh, with Kama Kama, you can see the, the fruit there, the watermelon as well. Um, and through this process, 
this with the kamakama, you can use the flowers and the fruit at different uh, stages of growth as well. We did have a really um, high pressure of weeds this season, uh, higher than expected, partly due to an optimum uh, weed growth conditions. Uh, we didn't quite have the site preparation time frames that we would have liked um, prior to us taking over the contract. And the delays that we had due to being such a wet lead up in the spring as well prior to planting. So the main issues we had were inkweed nightshade and alligator weed on the site. Uh, excuse me. Greg, uh, we have a question at this point from Councillor Kerno. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Greg. Um, can you just maybe expand a little bit on these? Uh, what what I'm going to use the the, the the phrase went wrong, but I, I mean, what what could we have done better in um, the site preparation timelines? Was it just purely to do with the wet spring? Was there anything else that sort of went on, or yeah? Yes, so we would have liked to have been able to start this probably this time last year. Mm -hmm. So in autumn, to be able to spray out the paddocks to, to combat the weeds prior to planting. Uh, we didn't have that opportunity. By the time we signed the contract, uh, it was in sort of June. We'd missed that, missed that window. And with the wet spring, everything was compressed. We couldn't get in there to do the required spraying. Everything just got shortened down to such a tight window to be able to get stuff in the ground. So are we going to be able to do do differently this year? Very much so. So uh, that, 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 that'll come up on the what's next. Great. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Councillor Mark Vincent has a question. Kia ora, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just on the same question of the, of the weeds, I mean, inkweed and nightshade, probably the seeds would have been there all along, whereas with alligator weed, it would have been visible, wouldn't it, at the time of the the preparation of the ground. Do you know what um, It was, it wasn't visible. The only place it potentially would have been visible is in that where the spring was, um, which was sprayed out, but wasn't cultivated. Um, so it could have, there was, there was nothing obviously visible. Um, but potentially it was in the surrounding areas and would have would have moved moved across the site throughout the season. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Vincent, if you'd please lower your hand. Thanks. Thank you. Greg, please proceed. Oh, sorry, Councillor Delavaris Woodcock. Sorry, sorry, uh, I I the Sometimes the software brings people who raise their hand to the front of the queue. This software doesn't. So if I'm if there's a delay here, it's because I'm having to scroll across the screens here. Okay. Sorry, Councillor Delavaris Woodcock has a question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My question was to clarify: Was this paddock sprayed in that narrow opportunity pre-sprayed prior to the planting? Yes, it was. Um, but when it was grass for the winter, it wasn't sprayed for weeds prior. So we'd missed that opportunity to be able to do that double spray to actually combat the weeds and seeds. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Greg, please proceed. Thank you. Okay, so some of the pests we had were armyworm. Uh, they loved the sweet corn, uh, absolutely decimated the whole crop, which was really unfortunate. Uh, we had a stock issue where they managed to get in through the two wire electric fence uh, a few times. They didn't cause too much plant damage, just more irrigation line damage. A little bit of powdery mildew. Uh, talking to our agronomists, contractors and growers, they all indicated that the season had been particularly challenging in terms of weeds and the pest pressures this year. Harvest uh, was awesome again, so having volunteers from Te Ora to do the harvesting of the watermelon and kamakamo. Uh, so they harvested about 419 kamakamo, uh, which was almost uh, a ton, and 30 watermelon. Um, really light on the watermelon because somebody had been in, into the site multiple times taking the watermelon, which was really unfortunate, uh, and we couldn't catch them. So our yields could have been quite a bit higher. So again, here's just a little bit of yield data based on the plot size, what we would have expected, 
for the watermelon would have been about 2.4 tons of site. We've got about what, uh, 0.16. Kamakama was a little bit light. Again, um, somebody had been helping themselves, got about half a ton. Uh, no doubt of sweet corn or the yams, unfortunately. The yams didn't make it either. Uh, question from Councillor Kuno. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, is, is is there any so do we have any ideas about how to combat the combat the theft issue? Because that seems uh, to have been our, yeah a, one of our main reasons that we haven't achieved the, the yields looking forward we were looking for. Yes, unfortunately, we have no security on site at that site. The camera that does take pictures only takes one per hour. So we don't have any real time monitoring. Um, and apart from somebody sitting on maybe on top of the container with a shotgun. Mm. Yeah, um, we are looking for next season at a remote camera that will actually take pictures based on motion. Okay, that's great. So you, you have a plan for that. Yeah, as long as that um, doesn't get removed as well. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. And it's just unfortunate being so close to the road as well. So, um, thank you, Greg. I have a question for you. Um, so, was there work done on what I'd call, if you like, because this is an experiment of a control where you were growing exactly the same crops in exactly the same soil and conditions without the irrigation so that you could compare what has been irrigated with what was not irrigated to sure. actually be able to say, look, it really worked or no, it didn't work, notwithstanding what was stolen here. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Mayor, short answer is no, that was not part of the contract. Uh, and we just don't have the available land to be able to do that on the site. So would you be considering such a control for the year or the next season ahead so that you actually can say, well, the water did something that the absence of water wouldn't have done. We can definitely do that, but it will narrow the window down of what we can water on that particular piece of land. So we'll be planting less under irrigation, but we can definitely put a strip in there or a couple of strips of non-irrigation. Because the, the purpose of the work is to ascertain whether irrigation actually helps or not. Yep, so we so can it's get... not it's not simply to grow more food. Um, it's a, it's like, do we need this here? This is the question the council has asked to do because there hasn't been much irrigation in Kaipara before. So the question quite simply is, well, do we need irrigation and what does it teach us or not? Those those are the sorts of questions that the council has long had here um, at the very genesis of this work. So I'd say any monitoring would need to frame up. Well, if we hadn't done this and grown the crops, we would have got X. Um, yep. So for, for this site one, that's very easy to do. Uh, we just don't install some of the irrigation down part of the crop. So we can do that. So, okay, thank you. Uh, um, uh, there may be other other commentary later in this item from other elected members in this space, but uh, it's certainly interesting for future uh, years and trying to maximise the science opportunity here uh, and research opportunity. That's what this is about. Um, thank you. Okay, please continue. Yeah. So we have a time lapse uh, video taken from the site. Showing the rollout of the irrigation here. See the combat of weeds already taken effect. We sprayed. They still come back. Any comment on that? So we move on to site two. So Ooh. that's it. Okay. Uh, Councillor De Lavaris Woodcock has a question. Yes, I can see the persistent 
um, return of, of the weeds, were there any, uh, can you hand weed when you've got drip line irrigation or is that an absolutely impossible? You can hand weed, but it's a, it's, it's a labour expense and it's very expensive to be able to hand weed. And speaking to other agronomists, is there, if this is what we'd say, I don't know, virgin, is, you know, has there been crops in this paddock before? No, so this, there... the, this was a virgin, virgin paddock for, for cropping. So has there, is there any knowledge of how many seasons it would take or how to uh, combat such a weed problem, weed infestation? Is it, do, would it run its course year upon year with consistent planting or? Yes. So year on year it gets better and better and better. Um, as I said earlier, with our lead in time for this particular season, it was compressed, we didn't, we couldn't spray in, in the autumn as we would have liked to have done because we haven't had the contract at that point in time. Um, but this following season we'll see a marked improvement. And it depends on the crops that we put in the ground, what we can actually apply in spraying to combat the weeds as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Greg, back to you, thanks. That's a site turn to Kopru. So the centre of the Pivot Irrigate is 242 metre span, uh, roughly 10 hectares. Water is gradually taken from this water source, the creek uh, that you see in the photo. We have an arable area of the project of two hectares, which is between the two red lines here. This is lovely, freshly cultivated soil. The crops that we are Chosen were soybean and mame, watermelon, uh, community vote on uh, kangama and beetroot. Uh, just in the foreground here of this picture, you can see some of the kangama that's already come up. So this is the centre pivot irrigator, uh, the centre pivot, and uh, in action you can see the spray heads going. So planting days, so we planted three crops using a maize planter, which was an awesome way of planting, uh, and putting a start to fertilize it alongside the seed gave the seed the best start. Beetroot, uh, being such a small size seed, we had to manually plant by hand. It's just too small to go through the, through the planter. So we had good crop growth in Kangama, uh, watermelon and beetroot, the soybean edamame, uh, that photo there is about half the size and height that we, that we really wanted it to be. So again, our wheat freshness here, this nightshade, wild portulaca, some kaikuia, and a bit of alligator wheat. And again, this site was fresh out of pasture as well. So again, the same, same pressures that we faced. Some pests, so uh, lupa caterpillar and the army worm loved the beetroot. Um, most of the beetroot had some army worm damage, but we did salvage a fair chunk of it. It was still edible and usable. So we did multiple harvests off the site of the watermelon, and um, so a bit of soybean and edamame and beetroot. Uh, we harvested just on this particular day with Moriora about 800 watermelon just to clean up the site. So a fair heap of watermelon that came out. Uh, Councillor Delavaris Woodcock has a question, Greg. Yes, yes a couple of questions. Uh, with the army worm, it, obviously you have to use a, a, a pesticide like a pre-emergent or put something in the soil. Is that correct to combat army worm? First question. Army worms are caterpillar. Um, so you would be using a, 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 a caterpillar specific spray um, over the over the site. Unfortunately, with the beetroot, we did not realise it was there until it was too late. So there was no spray applied. Okay. And do we know why the endamame or soybeans did not achieve the height that you would have desired? Um, I think it was, there was there was certainly weed pressure um, and there was also issues with the irrigator 
throughout the peak growing season. Um, there were, were, were numerous times, and we're, we can discuss this later, um, as to when we didn't have the pivot irrigator working and it was just the, the plants just weren't getting the water. Is that when the resource consent, the levels of the stream were too low? No, I think no. the technical issues with the pivot irrigator. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I've got a question here. Um, you're talking here about the harvest of the watermelons. Um, uh, so, so was there theft here? No, because uh, the watermelon and the beetroot were hidden behind a kind of mark in the road, so it wasn't visible. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll carry on, Greg. Thank you. So our yields uh, for the soybean and marmaid, you know, we were expecting about three tonnes per site, but just as Jeanette said, with the issues that we faced with the uh, application of water, weeds, we've got not a lot. Um, same with the beetroot, with our weed pressure and the army worm. We didn't get a lot of beetroot, but what we did get, uh, we did really well. Watermelon. Um, very few herbicides were registered that we could actually apply over the watermelon, so that did have an effect on, on our weeds. And quite a variation in the soil along the watermelon patch, so the back of it uh, didn't grow so well compared to the, to the front of the patch, so it was quite quite interesting in that regard. Uh, the Kanga Ma was looking awesome. There were some high winds that, um, that we had with, with the heat, and being such a narrow strip, uh, just decimated the uh, calamar, which is really unfortunate. Another time that's here at the irrigation site. Unfortunately, the camera unit uh, on the site did fail in mid February, so we did lose about a month's worth of photos. So you can see in the foreground the uh, soybean that had come up, and then we we pressured. Um, Added to it. So our learnings so far, sufficient lead in times need are needed for site preparation, so an autumn start, and, uh, and that's around preparing the land for a cover crop, getting rid of the weeds, we don't face the same weed issues. Climatic conditions prior to the site preparation, so for the season, current season we're in, we had such a wet uh, lead up the season, every time we went to go do the cultivation, the paddocks were just too wet. Um, at the coat crew, we probably would have had better chance of growing some rice with, with how much water was sitting in the paddocks. Paddocks fresh out of pasture and water crop do take a couple of seasons to get in. Uh, con constant weed issues, so the more water we apply, the more pressure the weeds uh, provide. Uh, some of the learnings, it's great to have engaged contractors on board. Uh, they've been a wealth of knowledge and information uh, and been quite critical to the success of actually getting stuff on the ground and harvested. Uh, don't rely on uh, contractors stating that all the equipment is on site. Um, we did discover with site one that not all the equipment was there when we had to roll it out. Some unforeseen irrigate, uh, issues with the pivot irrigator, with the GPS not working correctly, so I kept on losing its position. Pump pressures and programming all, all added to the issues of not getting water or the amount of water on as required at some of the critical times. Uh, some of the learnings is that having multiple crops in such a small area site is problematic. Uh, they all require different spray programs, uh, and that does cause a few headaches. So we'll be looking at reducing the number of crops. New equipment always has teething problems, uh, and we did need time to bed these in. So for the pivot irrigators, they should all be sorted for the coming season. And of course, COVID-19 has caused quite a few delays, um, also in getting some of these missing and complete parts from overseas. So what's next? Uh, we're about to uh, clear both the sites of weeds and the remaining plant material. We'll spray the sites out to kill any remaining plant material, weeds and seeds. Cultivate. Site one, we're going to plant a cover crop over winter of rye, of rye grass. 
Site two will be a clover cover crop for winter, and they both can be baled uh, at the end of uh, winter and feed up for autumn. And sites one or two, depending on the weather, will be uh, preparation will start in the autumn, the next growing season, and we're yet to determine what crops we're going to plant at the sites. Uh, thank you. Question, Councillor Kuno. Um, yes, I'm, I'm interested in um, a, a different outcome um, on the project, which is around the people who came to visit and the level of interest and, and whether there were people who sort of walked away going, right, I'm off to convert you know, six paddocks into watermelon. What, what, what happened with those visits? So we had some great, great community engagement of the set of the one on one visits um, and some of those were uh, some local growers just keen to see what was happening on the site and providing us with some knowledge of what they were growing their crops, um, especially in the Arapaji Peninsula. Um, there was there was nobody that went away saying that they were going to put six crops into and it's a six paddock into watermelon. Um, most of the growers or the, the people that turned up were smaller growers. Mm -hmm. um, there was one there was one lady who um, she she is she was looking more at doing herbs and that sort of thing. So they were interested in the irrigation systems probably more than the crops. Um, and because of the issues that we had, um, we didn't have the field days, the open field days like like we did. So there were, there were one on one um, visits on the on the sites, which um, and trying to schedule those, and we probably didn't get as many people through as we would have as if we had open field days. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Greg. And if you've finished your presentation at this point, if you could drop your shared screen. Thank you. Uh, we also have a question now from uh, Councillor Peter Weathy and then from Councillor Mark Vincent. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple of comments and uh, then leading into a couple of questions. <clears throat> I guess if I was a grower watching that presentation, I would say, well, thank God I'm not trying to irrigate crops in the Kuiper. There was a lot of negative stuff coming through there. And and I'm not sure that the ultimate objective has been clearly um, defined. The mayor touched on it and I touched on it last month at the meeting. And that is we've got to try and develop a business case that can sell this concept to potential growers in the Kuiper region. And, and that means we've got to be able to show that there is almost a guaranteed increase in yields and that we get very good commercial returns. Now, without a, a pilot um, or sorry, a reference plot of, of exact, treated exactly the same as what you're doing with the irrigation, but not being irrigated to show these potential growers the benefits of irrigating and what can be accomplished, we're really not doing well. The other thing that worried me when I listened to the presentation, to be fair, is when you look at the pests that ravaged the beetroot, did anyone go and talk to other beetroot growers in, in the north, north of the North Island and find out what likely pests and how to control them are likely for, for crops of beetroot? Have we done enough research to plan a proper experiment? Because quite honestly, from my experience, and this goes back a long, long way, this doesn't seem to have been a very well planned experiment to get the case study that we're looking for. So what I'm wanting to ask, will we in the second round, because I think we can put this particular um, year's trials down as a learning curve, a fairly low level learning curve. So let's see if we can take a gigantic step up next time, have your reference plot so you've got something to compare, get as much information from uh, other people who are experienced growers so that we can actually learn so that we don't end up with a, a chapter of unfortunate occurrences as we've just heard in this presentation because really it's a little disappointing from someone just standing and looking in uh, to see that we haven't made as much ground as we'd hoped to make. 
And um, so let's hope next year is going to be a lot, lot more positive. But could you answer those two questions about uh, how we're planning our next year's experiment? So we did reach out to the Veggie Growers Association uh, to ask those questions multiple times, and uh, unfortunately, that never came back to us. Uh, which is a little bit frustrating. We're tapping, trying to tap into that knowledge of, of what their industry grows, and and got nothing back. Uh, next season, yes, it'll be a marked improvement. We won't be doing four crops per site. We'll narrow, narrow that down to one or two, and we'll have those controls in place. Good, thank you. I think the control is absolutely imperative to have that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Vincent. Question for clarification. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Here, yeah, I um, actually, Councillor Worthy answered the guts. Of what I was going to actually ask Vaughan to um, sell me the proposition on the basis of the information that's been provided because I um, remain to be convinced about the benefits of irrigation in this situation from what we've seen so far. However, um, I'd, I'll ask a question about just what I um, get the impression from a comment that somebody made, uh, perhaps there is going to be a future for um, like boutique style growing of specialist crops in, um, in various crooks and nannies around the place uh, where there are pockets of um, more versatile soils that, that are available for that purpose. It isn't necessarily going to be um, rolling out in, in tens of hectares, but in fact will be a hectare or half a hectare, and they get the benefit of that um, precision irrigation so that the uh, water is made best use of. So d do you see that as one of the learnings that might well come out of, of future trials? Yes. Yeah. Yep. I, I think there's this from what we saw, there was more interested in more interest in the boutique style and new crops um, with lifestyle growers and people moving into, into the area than, than possibly some of your long standing um, conventional farmers. Um, Actually, um, as much as anything, that was a comment about the draft district plan. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, thank you, and thank you, Jeanette. Uh, Councillor Delavaris Woodcock, question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My question is about this Kai irrigation project being at all compatible or linked to the peanut growing trials, and is there is there a link between them? And if there isn't, why not? Paul? Yeah, I wonder, Mr. Mayor, I wonder if I might answer that. Um, please, please. Yep. So, the, I mean, the, look, the short answer is there isn't a, a direct link between the two projects, although um, the, the same team here is delivering them. The, the quite different scale of what we're trying to achieve, and this comes back to, I think, part of Peter Worthy's question. For me, these sites are about demonstration. So they are about trying to generate interest and get people into a discussion and that's going to you don't know where that discussion is going to go it might go down to the really boutique growing stuff um it might go into some new stuff or you might find someone who's growing on a very big commercial scale does pick up a pivot irrigate and do something with it but the for me the point of them was these were demonstration sites trying to generate interest and help go on the step the peanut trial in my mind is the next step where we are we are really in the commercial um, we're in the proving the commercial phase of peanuts, so we are doing a, a much more intensive um, approach there. We are using everything at commercial scale with peanuts, um, and what we want to come out the other end with is a very clear business case that says this is what you can grow peanuts for. This is all your costs, all your inputs, all your process for doing it, and this is the return per hectare you're going to get, and this is your market. This is who you can sell your peanuts to for X amount of dollars. So quite a and the scale of funding between those two things is quite different, but they are they are an evolution. So you can you can demonstrate and get interest, and if someone becomes interested, which is what's happened with peanuts, you can then pick it up and say, okay, let's let's take it a bit further, in a bit more detail for a year or two, prove it's commercial. What we then hope at the end of year two of the peanut trials 
as people do take up five hectares of peanuts and start growing them within their farming system. So the use of a pivot, pivot irrigator, though, is not at all related to boutique scale growing. So I'm wondering, uh, I guess what I would like to concur and support the points made by my colleagues that the next trial, uh, you know, needs to be thought out better so that the, uh, you know, that there's control plots or if if the Tacopuru is a site that is conducive because of a pivot irrigation system to a commercial scale operation, then there needs to be crops planted that are of commercial benefit rather than um, more boutique niche crops, perhaps. So thank you for your commentary. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, I have a question um, and it comes back to the uh, choices of the crops that have been put in place here and the system, in fact, that's been put in place. Um, first of these questions is a really simple question um, for Vaughan and Greg. Um, this, uh, the council and the committee here has been very, very clear about the opportunity that we see from having irrigation for the shoulder season for the second crop that would occur and be being planted in January or February and being irrigated in a kind of out of season moment, if you like, for what's normal in the local area. Um, this council and this committee has spoken many, many times of, on that. It's been in all of the origination documents for the entire Kai irrigation project. And in fact, at every single one of these externally funded projects committee meetings, we've raised that point. So the simple question is, um, has, have you heard that? Did the message get back to you about not irrigating a October planted crop, but in fact, the benefits of starting off a completely new crop in January or February with that water? Our, our original intent was to plant two crops. So, but because of the nature of this season being so late, we didn't farm until late November. That didn't allow for a February crop to be planted. Okay, thank you. So, so Did, the next if, season if, we'll be looking at something that we can plant later as well. So whether we plant an early crop or we just wait until a plant a later crop, yet to be decided. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. So again, in the nature of a science experiment, there are many approaches that could be taken here, but um, uh, we are uh, keen for there to be that analysis done and would be very, uh, very sorry that it hasn't been done for this year that we're in right now. Uh, Councillor David Wills. We haven't the analysis yet. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, before I start, I, I appreciate that you guys have picked up this project midstream, um, and I've been careful not to comment on this particular project, but I have got a couple of practical questions. Uh, you mentioned theft of the product up at the, um, the north project but you're looking to plant again despite that. Are you going to use, try vegetables that are less likely to be pinched or, or what, what, what are your, what's your solution to that issue? For my, my first question, please. Well, the solution to combat that would be to put in a motion detected camera. So that'll take pictures of, based on the motion and that'll identify the, the people that are actually going on site that shouldn't be there. Um, we want to be able to plant the best crop that's going to have the best opportunities to grow with water. So, I mean, realistically, that's not a solution because it's not likely to last long. But anyway, moving on. So I'm, I'm just saying that this is 
uh, and again, this is no disrespect to, to you, but this project has been a repetition of failure. So I'm asking what the key differences you're going to make to have it actually become successful for a change. Um, again, not putting the blame on you, but asking how you're going to set that so it does actually become successful. Um, if you don't get the engagement of the local community up there to help you protect it, even with eyes on the roads or some community um, attitude, a camera is not going to fix that theft problem. So the reason that we knew that the crops were being stolen was with locals telling us. Um, it was one of the one of the workers on the farm that, that let us know that, that that was happening. So there is there is local interest definitely, um, and we will just work on that. Um, and yeah, we've had we've had a really good relationship with them, so we'll just build on that for next season. Um, yeah, because I mean, of, of all the choices, things like watermelons are the, the, the most easily pinched and enjoyed. So, yep. I mean, and tradable. So, probably a, a different choice of crop um, yep. might be a solution to that. Uh, moving on from that, my a question were the contractors between the two sites, was there any commonality of the contractors or the crops? Yes, the same contractors used at both sites. Okay, the reason I ask that is that I noted in your report that both sites had army worm issues and yet I'm not aware and I'm from that area that there was any widespread army worm problems on the coast. Uh, the reason I ask that is that one of the greatest ways of contaminating a site with army worms is by the contractor's gear or the plant material on that machinery. What yep. are, you, are you looking to, to remove that risk this next time? Um, it's something that we can look at, but we struggled to get contractors that were interested in, in assisting us with the project. So um, whether that's an option, I, I don't know. So, so okay, my question then is, is, is any effort being made to identify why both sites had army worm infestations when they weren't broad across the area? Has any effort been to identify how that took place? And the impact that's had on these crop successes. No, we can look at that as part of our findings and our, and our end of season report. So the answer is no. The answer at this stage is no, but we will look into that and add that into our um, end of well, season. Well, I mean, sorry, but because I, I, I don't mean again, but your army worm had a significant impact. Surely that would be a focus on identifying how to prevent that reoccurring for this next crop cycle, please. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, and moving on, the other comment that you made verbally was that the site at Tecobra was so wet that you couldn't get on there and put a crop in. How will we ensure that there's some benefit out of the cost of that irrigation when it's already identified as a very wet location to start with? Well, it was wet because it was such a wet spring, so every time it started to dry up, there was more rain. And we can't, we can't control the weather, unfortunately. Uh, we can modify the crops that go in there to try and generate some success. I'm I'm looking for some success out of this because the, the council has been um, associated with the success or failure of this particular project. At a local we, could, we, we, we couldn't get on site with machinery to cultivate the coke root because it was so wet. That that's what ended our, our start. We can't we, we don't want to go in there and damage the soil structure. Prior to planting. So, could the alternative have been a manual planting like the North Crop with a different rotation? It still needs to be cultivated, and that's two hectares. I think I'm, I'm, I hope you got, I'm, I'm wishing for success with this project as a way of helping the locals. So, um, I, my questions are just that we don't. You have come on board with this, this last rotation. I've been here for two of these rotations and they haven't been that successful to date. So my questions are trying to direct it a way of making them successful in the future. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So just Greg, just in uh, responding in there in your in your response to Councillor Wills's last question. Um so when the spring was so wet and difficult, um was it a thought or was it considered to actually abandon a spring planting That's right. to wait and use the wonderful irrigation 
to be able to plant slightly out of sync to what would normally happen with normal seeds requiring rain to germinate, did it, was it a thought to actually go, we have this wonderful gift of a super wet spring, let's not plant in the spring and let's plant on the 5th of January? So what we, the crops that we selected for that site had a wrong window where, where we could plant. So we used that window to actually plant at the end, end of the spring. So I, so I guess I'm, I'm talking here about the reflexiveness of your experiment here to be able to pick something faster, such as courgettes planted in January and irrigated that would grow and fruit. Yep. Yes. Um, because for the design for next year, that again, to prove the value of the irrigation rather than just the rain falling from the sky, that's what we're trying to do here. Yeah, because any moron can grow maize, you know, and, and you know, I can speak as moron who grows maize, you know, so uh, it's, yeah, um, it, it's, it's a thing and the rain falls and it grows and we, take a hit with army worms. So we're trying to do something better here. Yes. Um, the, the other thing as well, just regarding the notion of the theft and or security issues, one of the uh, opportunities from the uh, site number one uh, was in fact for it to be a trial for small water use rather than the large irrigator, large volumes of water being used. Uh, and the potential for that to be transportable across, or the learnings from that, across Kaipara District to other places where there is very little water as well, such as the wonderful Tara Road soils near Mangafai, uh, where again there are boutique lettuce and um, herb growers and so on and so on. Um, the, would there be potential to relocate that project? For year two, if security is an issue. All right. Um, thank you for the, the thought. Mia, the question needs to be put straight back to council. We're contracted to deliver this on two sites. We had no we had no say in selection of those sites. And um, so it, it's not a question for us. It's a question for you as contract holder. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. That's clear, Councillor Weddy. Yeah, uh, Mr. Mayor, you you um, touched on exactly what I was about to say, and that is, um, looking in hindsight, I wonder whether or not it would have been better to have it completely cancelled the first planting and said we're going to start planting in in late January or, or whatever ever to get that potential second crop uh, and and rank that against what we you know what could be grown under irrigation. And I wonder whether we, you see, just by going and, you know, the explanation about you push some of those plantings right back to the tail end of the window for planting, but that just meant that the harvest went further out into the area where you'd be wanting to plant your second crop. So it didn't really achieve anything. And I'm just wondering whether or not you need to really start um, having a number of, of this, I'm looking at your second season here to try and get the maximum um, positive result out of that as possible, but you need to have several alternative contingencies which are going to be determined by what weather eventuates in the spring of this year, uh, so that you're not solely stuck in a one option only, which then gets undermined if the weather doesn't come in exactly as, as, as you'd hope it would come in. If we have several options, we can then play those options because I think we could have learned a lot more out of this last season uh, had we had that flexibility and, and made those decisions, cancelled the first planting, concentrated after Christmas, and that would have given during the time the first planting went in, perhaps more time to get weed control and other, other uh, options um, perhaps put in place. But have, can, you, can you do something like that for the second round, have that flexibility so that we can get something, because we really can't go for another season and not get a much more positive end result. Yeah, we sure can, and we, and we sure will. Thank you. I would like to add to that, um, if I can. That's something we need to renegotiate. So we need to renegotiate the contract if we wish to deliver that. We, we would love to have had that flexibility from day one. We haven't had it. 
Um, we so absolutely we'd like to be able to deliver that for you, but we, we'll need to relock and we need to work with your team on on the scope of the contract. We were quite restrictive on what sites we had, what crops we could plant, and what window we had. So I agree with you. Those are the learnings we got out of it. We now need to renegotiate and look at how we deliver year two. Thank well, you. I think that's what we, very that's clear. What hmm. That's what we should do because this first season has been a big learning curve, and now we've got to really use that to springboard into something that we can get some really positive results out of. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Councillor uh, Vincent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Look, um, perhaps uh, my thinking process of slowly uh, catching up with with what's going on, and it it, it seems to me that. Um, Northland Inc is acting in effect as a project manager with this project. Would that be right, Vaughan? As the primary role? Yeah, I, it's, it's primarily you consider it a delivery contract. Yeah, so we're project managing the sites and delivering them for you. Yeah, because I wonder, I mean, do you have any specialist horticulturalists on board with um, giving sort of technical input on other than you've, you've mentioned about trying to make contact with the Vegetable Growers Association for, for, for their input and expertise. And uh, you've mentioned how the contractors have been a very valuable source of information, but do you have any sort of um, specialist technical expertise? And hopefully I'm not um, insulting anyone who's um, in the e uh, group session this morning, but I, I, um, I don't know what everybody does, but I know Vaughan that um, unless you have a second career in hiding, I don't expect that you would be regard yourself as a horticultural expert. Certainly don't. I do have a second career in hiding, but um, our horticultural specialist is, is Jeanette sitting next to Greg. But okay. I think the challenge that we're all facing is um, how much how much important decision making was done around selecting those first crops and those first sites. Um, okay. We can, we need to learn from that and look to what we do next year. Sure. Okay. So you have that expertise on board. Uh, that's reassuring because it seems like that yeah things didn't get off to a great start. And with um, yes, I know. Okay. I don't need to ramble on any further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, so elected members, um, I believe we're at the end of our questions for clarification at this point. Um, of course, this is a subject. Uh, about which um, all, all the council is very passionate. So, Councillor Kerno, you've raised your hand. Is that because you're ready to make your statement? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, at this point, um, Vaughan and Greg, uh, thank you for your questions for clarification. The elected members are now going to start making speeches around um, the subject of what's gone on here. So, you may take your screens back to blank. Thank you. But please, the item is not concluded yet. Kia ora. Thank you. Councillor Kerno, opening statement here. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Mayor. Yes. Um, I, I, I feel like the, the team have taken a bit of a hammering today and you know, it's certainly not been the outcome that we were hoping for, but I also want to acknowledge the work that they've put in to try and make something of this season, which got off to a, a late start because of contracting issues, a wet start because of the weather. Um, so they, they, they've been up against it. So I do want to acknowledge the work that the team have done and I also want to acknowledge um, all the help from the community, um, seeing all those people in there doing the planting and the harvesting and distributing the food that we did manage to produce is, yeah, that, that was great to see. Um, I, well, I do want to um, lend my support to the idea of that um, kind of um, the, the comparative planting. So trying not to sort of do something totally different next year, but to focus on yeah, maybe learning, taking a couple of the things that either went really well or really badly and trying to build on those and see if we can get it right this year. Um, and yeah, and have, and hoping that this year, because we are starting earlier, because of the contract is already in place, that we can get that preparation done properly. And then if it turns out to be that really wet spring, uh, again, then we can look at delaying if we've, 
if we've got the time to talk through those contractual contractual issues. And I also want to sort of just acknowledge the team that um, because this took a while to get into place, we we as a council or a committee um, here did put quite a lot of pressure to get something in the ground because we were aiming for those two crops. And so maybe you know our, our that we have contributed in a way by putting that pressure. And so hopefully this year we can work better with the team who are doing the project management with our expectations to actually um, try and deliver something that has a, a, a better outcome. Um, and finally, yes, security um, is clearly vital at that um, the Aranga site. Um, so I'm hoping that perhaps with secure, better security and also perhaps some work within the community to really try and identify why people are doing this and help them understand that this is actually a project that, that benefits the community in the long term anyway. And so when you're stealing from the paddock, you're actually stealing from members of the community who maybe need the help from that food. Um, so yeah, so layers upon layers in this, but I'm hoping that maybe the second year we can use those learnings and um, to you know, have a better outcome. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Councillor Joyce Pucky, statement. Hi, you know. Um, and I thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm hoping you can all hear me. Um, well, that uh, was a long question and presentation. Almost felt, um, I do agree with Councillor Kuno. I felt like we were giving them a real beating, but hindsight is a wonderful thing. And this was always a trial, and some trials go well and some not so well. And in this case, we seem to be on the ladder. Um, I suppose I've taken in all all the feedback that I've just heard, and it's quite it's quite overwhelming in a sense that there are far no out there that need to steal a kai, and I'll tell you right now, it's because people are short of kai for a number of reasons. So my only hope is that they took it, they ate it, and they were well from it. Um, and then it wasn't wasted. So, um, yeah, there's some real learnings in this project to um, take into the next season, and be it far from me to know anything about growing kai on a mass scale to comment any further than that. But, yeah, thank you for your effort, your mucky to date, and um, kia kaha, keep going, come too far. Um, to give up now. So, Kia ora. Kia ora, uh, elected members, are there further comments, <laughs> statements to be made here? Councillor Vincent. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I'd like to say, uh, uh, among others, you know, I've been criti critical of aspects of this program, but um, I would say to the team from. Um, where are you going? You're not, oh, sorry, I'm. I'm Northland Inc. Yeah, yeah, Northland Inc. Sorry, I had volunteering Northland in my head. Um, the the team from Northland Inc. that um, appreciate you fronting up today. And um, if everything had gone well, we wouldn't be learning anywhere near as much. So this has been an awesome learning opportunity. And um, let's just hope that um, that takes it on to the uh, a much more positive outcome next time round. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Withy, statements. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, following on from Councillor uh, Vincent. Um, yeah, I think we have learned something, and it's, it's a bit like what the old blacks always find when they have a loss. They learn more, more about themselves when they lose to a team than when they have a good victory. And I think that we can take the same out of this. And this is one of the positives that I see is that we've found out a lot of things that have uh, either not worked or alternatively, we've got to take a lot more um uh control over for the second second um season that we plan and i think that will give us a very very much better platform on which to go forward and get the results that we're all hoping for so i i, I hope that all the north and team um take the comments we've made today uh in that light 
and and also and I, I take Vaughan's point that in fact uh, there may need to be uh, a bit of a, a relook at the flexibility because one thing we can't control we can might control most things in an experiment but one thing we can't control is the weather and we've got to factor that that uh, um, uncertainty into our experiment plan and and that possibly one of the things that wasn't really fully understood uh, when we went into that first season. So I think we have learned a lot and uh, hopefully that's going to give us a much better platform on which to spring into the second season of planting and we'll see the results on a very much more positive vein when we address them in a year's time. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further statements? Um, quick statement from me, uh, this, this project is being particularly um, operative, if you like, uh, uh, and involving many of the community in a hands-on way. Um, and there is, there is much that's good here. Uh, and we've come a very, very long way. The bigger principles that are at work here are about how to better use water for irrigation. It's actually not about growing food in any particular season, but actually how Kaipara uh, is, should position itself better for a climate change future where water storage is going to be needed rather than the rain falling from the sky. Um, the, so um, the opportunities that this project gives us links with the Taitokara Water Storage, the Dam Water Storage Trust, um, uh, and their giant project near Te Kōpuru, uh, with other water storage projects that are going on with, and as I say, a climate change future. Everyone, um, we need to take this long view, take a breath after this year and the learnings that are here and say, yes, we're still, uh, very committed about growing the kai in Kaipara and how we best do that and position these opportunities with this particular experiment to help line us all up for the future. Certainly using the uh, Vegetable Growers Association and the Northern Wairo uh, Vegetable Growers Association and the Coomera Growers Association and so on and all of the expertise that's there in our local community uh, from, from many, many people who uh, have had very, very successful horticulture businesses in the local area is also a very important opportunity for us. And the Kaipara way is to take all of our people with us rather than to leave people behind. Um, and so I'm, I'm really uh, optimistic for what all of this project gives us uh, and I'm going uh, yes that you if you like you you grow uh, when you're pushing against something that's very very hard and challenging and this is certainly hard and challenging and this is how we grow uh, so as a council I'm looking forward to uh, the opportunities and the papers coming around for season two here uh, and for the council to revisit the elected members here to be revisiting some of the assumptions of what we are expecting uh, of our um, professional project managers here in Northland Inc who are doing a great job. So congratulations, Greg, out there in the field uh, where you've been uh, and engaging with all of the community and Vaughan for your um, leadership uh, as well. And, uh, and, it, and Jeanette, as well uh, for your uh, expert input. But the, as far as I'm concerned, um, I would say this, I'd say just don't be a stranger, really. Uh, this council is very, very passionate and the elected members are very passionate about this work, uh, which is why we've spent nearly an hour and a quarter on this one item uh, here today, uh, because uh, this discussion has been a long time overdue and a long time coming. So uh, looking forward to your further uh, successes and hearing more in the future. Thank you. Are there any further statements? We'll go back to Councillor Kurnow for a closing statement. Thank you. 
Um, nothing further to add. My colleagues have, have said it all. Okay, thank you, thank you. So we're putting this item to the vote now for the noting of this report. All those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Against. Carried. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, uh, thank you, Greg and Vaughan uh, and Jeanette. Thank you for your attendance this morning. So, elected members, sorry, we've been going for an hour and 10 minutes at this point. Are you needing a break at this point or should we proceed? Uh, <clears throat> five minutes. Break. Five minutes? Five minutes? Okay, we'll take quick five minutes. We'll see you back at 10.45. Thank you. Kia ora. Okay, see you, everybody.
Lovely. Right. Keldai Koto. Uh, we'll ready to make a start again uh, when we've got a quorum here. Yay, lovely quorum. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to proceed at this point with the next item being the Kaihu Valley Trail project. So I'm seeking a mover for the noting of this item. Councillor De La Varis Woodcock, thank you. And a seconder here. Councillor Kerno, thank you. So uh, Eros, kia ora. It's going to be Greg Montes, I think, speaking on the Kaihu. Okay, sorry about that. Sorry, I was going. He's going to be papers. Greg. Yes, yeah, sorry, Greg's going to be doing items four through to ten. Okay, sorry. Okay, thank you, Greg. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you. Um, apologies for the confusion of that. Yeah, I think Eros's name's on the report, um, but yeah, yes. I'll be talking to the uh, the um, the roading reports that have come up um, and answering any questions. Um, yeah, the KVT um, report, I'll take it as read. Um, not significant updates from, from when the report was published. Um, the, the team is carrying on with the consultation with the um, various stakeholders and progressing that and looking at options still, um, carrying on with the works on separate portion four. Um, yeah, and um, working with MB, I suppose, of just some of our timelines and what that means and some options at the moment, but happy to take any questions. For clarification. Thank you. Uh, Councillor De La Varis Woodcock, question. Uh, yes, I'd like to know about the uh, stakeholders, the landowners visits, it says in the report, they're ongoing and there's a specific uh, glitch or hitch with the Donnelly's Crossing concession in separate portion one. Could you talk to the resolution pro process that's involved with the trail, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, specifically for that and the stakeholders there, obviously there's um, landowners there adjacent to the property and I suppose interests in the land. Um, the land is um, of that part on, well, the, the trail where we want to go through there is on dock land. So um, dock is currently doing their due diligence on that. Um, I think there's been some queries raised just about ownership of the land um, and rights. So it's DOC is going through their process of um, historical sort of due diligence to see, to make sure that they've got everything in line before they make a decision on providing us with a concession to go through there. So that's currently being worked through at the moment with their solicitors. Um, looking back on that, we were expecting an answer, I think, we'll see. Well, today, um, but unfortunately due to COVID, um, the solicitor who's going through that process and doing the due diligence has been off for two weeks. So they have given him an extension to his sort of work um, to the end of this month. So hopefully we will hear soon after that um, and then we'll be able to determine what our options are with that. Uh, so I have about three questions or two and I'll just go through them. So the mention is there's placemaking being done at Perore, uh, Donnelly's, uh, and so I understand that's great. Is there also, um, is there a budget for that? And what is it? I mean, what is the placemaking involved? And is there also some emphasis for placemaking to support the trail in the Dargaville end? Yeah, um, the place maker, I suppose, is trying to look at those options of interest, really, uh, and, and bring some interest in there um, to bring some attractions to the trail as well. So the team are looking at out of what what the, the history is there and, and what are the options are of being able to celebrate the, the trail. Um, there is certainly budget within of doing some sort of place making. I know the team are looking at other options in terms of funding. Um, so Amanda is working very hard of looking at options throughout the whole trail to, to, to give it more interest as well. So places where people can stop, links to businesses, what it may be, um, and also looking at then possible applications for TIF funding, um, if we can come up with that, a package of work that, that would help to, to fund that. Um, and that might be toilets and maybe other things that are part of that sort of placemaking. Um, so we're, we're currently looking at those options. We didn't 
we didn't do it this round and i think the next round of funding is coming up um and we would look to see if we can have an application in there to, to help bolster what we're building sorry that's for tiff funding just to yeah. be clear yes okay thank you thank you councillor delivaris woodcock next question Thanks. um yeah so how's the waka kotahi negotiation to use the portion in front of te hohanga marae uh going of, of the railway there um Sorry, can you clarify uh, the Waka Kotahi funding? We've got we've got six hundred thousand approved. I think three hundred thousand, three hundred fifty thousand of that is for um, specifically for a bridge construction, um, and the remaining okay. budget. Uh, so one of one of the glitches or or to uh, Hohanga Marae have have requested that the trail does not uh, go in front of. Yeah. of the marae um for cult, you know because yeah that, yeah yeah we're, so certainly, the, we're yeah. certainly working with Tiho Honga marae at the moment and and having conversations and meetings of around the options there um you'll see in the report we've identified a possible option of going in the other side of the railway um so taking it off the road putting on the railway past the marae and um, we've had conversations with kiwi Rail who have um tentatively approved the, the doing that with the subject to detailed design and drawings and, and and so they're they're reasonably happy with us to go on the rail and um, so that's resolved possibly resolved that option of, of, of the, the concerns raised with the Tihonga Marae we are also continuously now having conversations with the the section around with the uh, Europa and the, the link between the Marae and the Europa and the, the the cultural significance between those two uh, and the linkages and where the trail goes um, <clears throat> on that section so we are I think we've got a, a meeting maybe scheduled maybe this week or next week um, with some of the Mariah members to, to go out and walk that site and get a better understanding of the concerns and, and look at options of what is achievable. Um, is there options of, of, of um, going in the real corridor there as well um, and what we can actually do in that. So there's further discussions as well on, on that section. My final question is uh, from our last meeting for externally funded projects <clears throat> committee, there was discussion around the table that we needed to have some community engagement, some uh, stakeholder meetings, and some stories about this project being told, uh, because there's still a level of, um, you know, m people in, in Kaihu that are going to be impacted, for example, uh, they feel as if they're not being updated or communicated with. So what are the plans for community engagements and meetings where we can tell stories about this project and answer our community's questions and get some excitement. Yeah, um, we've certainly put a lot of effort into communications and trying to keep those lines of communications open with all stakeholders and and, and general public as well. Um, I know Amanda has a newsletter that goes out on a monthly basis of what we're doing um, with maps and, and the status of the project and, and various items going on that goes to um, all the stakeholders and, and anyone she comes in contact with in terms of an email address. We do um, publications um, also that we put out. So um, we're certainly putting a lot of effort into into there. Obviously, there's still it, it, it's still a bit of uncertainty of <clears throat> exacts of where we're going in some of the projects and the locations. Um, so we're just trying to be open and honest with that with the community of where we're sitting at. But um, uh, we can certainly look to see if there's more options around that consultation if there if there's certainly a gap and, and we're missing and telling that story okay thank you those are my questions thank you thank you thank you, thank you. you. councillor kerno question yeah thank you mayor um kia ora, greg um yes yeah, so just a question about this idea <clears throat> of going in the rail corridor um and yeah, assuming that was okay with the marae, what happens if that rail line comes back into use? Um, yeah, well, I, I suppose current such a, a situation with the rail line is it is mothballed. It's currently leased to um, a local business um, who, who runs a golf course on that. We we have had discussions with them in terms of um, leasing part of that land that decides it because I think currently they hold the lease. Um, I don't know. I, I, Kiwi, ha, Kiwi Rail haven't suggested any any plans to bring that rail back in line. Um, okay. 
So I don't, we haven't really looked at that option or, or brought that onto the table, but we haven't been made aware of any potential future plans of next 20, 30 years of what they're thinking. Um, okay. So we, we've assumed that it's it, it's mothballed and it'll stay that way. And the existing leaseholder, are they comfortable with the idea? Yeah, we've we've had initial conversations. The team has spoken with that, uh, the through Kiwi Real initially through their lease manager. Um, and they, they've certainly indicated that they are happy to work with KDC and coming up with an option. Obviously, if they see the benefit of the trail and, and what that could potentially bring in. Um, and obviously, there there will be a cost saving for the leasee of, of, of KDC taking over part of the lease of that land. Yeah. Um, and just one final question sort of around that this this subject. I sort of look on, on the... Um, the, the maps that you provided us um, sort of following on in the report, was there ever any suggestion to follow the river for that first part in inseparable portion five? And I'm sorry, just... From Dargaville, you know, finding a way to somehow to the river and then following the river round until where it joins the, the off-road route. So yeah, um, it would be, be longer. Yeah, yeah, we do follow the river and parts going through there, but it's we we are looking to I suppose just find a, a way through and then and the not the the easiest route, but just what's the the, the overall sort of best route. Um, we've certainly got sections of the road that will be on, um, or sections of paper road that we're on, and having that be able to connect up. So we do touch on the river, but we don't follow it precisely the whole way. But it's yeah, there is aspects of it where we're beside the river. If if all else fails, would that be an option? Um, it could be. We in 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 terms of several portion five, I think, yeah, we're certainly looking at all the options at the moment of where that goes. I suppose current negotiations and discussions with the the Tihong Amarai is is the preference to to try and come along there because we do have yeah, it's yeah. it's deemed as an easier route. But yeah, there's certainly it could be an option that we look at. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So, Greg. Greg, I have a question for you, and it and it's I'm I'm very happy to say I'm quite confused here. <clears throat> uh, there are two maps that were provided with our papers yeah. here, <clears throat> uh, and I'm talking here to separable portion <clears throat> four, which is between Mamaranui and Parori, very near Dargaville Town. Yeah, um, yeah. one of those maps says that the route is along Opanaki Road all the way. Yeah. Except it's got an outreach piece that comes out to a a potential kayaking destination. Yeah. Uh, so I'm quite confused as to why that model is there. And then you have the second map, which has the river bank being the route, and yeah. Opanaki Road is not being used. So, yeah. uh, but the reason I'm talking about confusion here is that I don't see in the notes here any explanation as to why we've got two maps. Yeah, yeah apologies the for that. decision yeah. is, whose decision it is, yeah. where this is at, and if you could just shed some light on that, because I can see that there's kind of options, yeah. if you like, but yeah. if you could just clarify yeah. that. Thank you. What we've tried to do, I suppose, is 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 put where our final state is in the second map and, and, and the first map being the interim route where we think we will possibly land. Because um, obviously with the funding we've got, um, I think with the project being a several million dollar project and, and, and not obtaining all the funding, it was always going to be a part on road, part off road route that we could get um, with the intention of then seeking other funding options to come back at a later date and fill in some of the gaps. What the first map is showing is the potential interim route of where we think we can, what we can build with the money we've got and what will be on road. Um, obviously, you, there's a big long section up there of the uh, Upanaki Road um, because there's still some um, work to do, I suppose, on that separate portion four, the, the top end of it, just with what the options are in there. But in the interim, we want to take several portion four as far as we can and, and make it nearly a destination point where you can cycle out. Um, from Dargaful and then have some sort of destination as the, the, the kayak sort of point and then turn around and go back. Um, but if you did want to cycle the whole section, you would have to then turn off onto Upanaki Road and the interim, come up to Maramara, um, 
and then join the trial again back up there. But the long term option being that we want to be able to find a route either through along by the river um, and along back at the the Taite Marai, um, or potentially follow the the existing sort of rail corridor and um, paper road sort of heading up. So it's there's still options in there. But what we wanted to do was just try and highlight of and be transparent of what the the intern option could possibly look like um, at this point. Okay, okay thank you. So, uh, thank you, thank you. That's clear. Yeah, um, Councillor Wills. Uh, I think um, um, anyway, I'll go next. Thank you. I, there was somebody in front of me. Um, this is not to do with the rail trail, but an associated activity. Um, Greg, can you, I was talking to somebody that's been working on that proposed mountain bike park, and they said that that's progressing. It's not being done by council, but it, it is sort of an associated activity. Have you got any information or is there any coordination with how that project is going? That's the um, mountain bike, proposed mountain bike park and that um, uh, pine plantation. Yeah, yeah. Um, the team is certainly um, liaising and in consultation with the, the, the guys doing the work up there, um, along with obviously the, the Tilt Renewable Farm on that section as well. Um, and and it's, it's something we're aware of and it's something that I suppose that has good synergies with the, the track of what we're doing and, and trying to make sure that there, there possibly is a, a link in there out to to the mountain bike track um so they are they are working with that um and potentially that link could be linked in with the the access tracks to the the, the wind farm um so there, there's certainly a couple of parties that we're having discussions with of future potential options of how we link in there is that, does that include something to do with possibly a cycleway underneath that proposed transmission line i'm just asking is because that there's quite a, well, I understand there's a reasonably significant effort being put into those activities that are on that yeah. coastline for, for future yeah. Um, cycle use. Yeah, my understanding is that it is it links into um, the tilt and um, and and working with their access track and being able to have some sort of joint access track where they've got access to their tilt farm, um, but then obviously we've got access to the mountain bike track, um, and then coming up with some agreement of joint ownership maintenance sort of thing going forward of what that track could look like. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vincent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Greg, I, um, I read through and saw that there's several places where, at least as an interim measure, the intention is to use you know, part of the existing roading network to, to join things up. Um, I didn't get from it, though, that there was any special treatment going to be given to those roads, say, in terms of improved site benching or localised widening or um, smoothing the surface more than otherwise would have been the case. Um, is that sort of implied by using the, those roads, just for the sake of it being a better ride for people on, on cycles and safer? Yeah, um, no, not at this point. There will be maybe some some elements in there in terms of if there's safety issues identified on that road, um, sort of blind corners or things that we, we might have to look at. But it's at this point, it's just using the actual road as it stands. Um, so is that something that might fit into the formula, though, in terms of benefit cost uh, ratios, like for those roads, given that that's an, um, a stated intention to use them as a cycleway, does that actually add some weight to um, be able to draw extra funding to those roads? It, it, it certainly does. If, it, if we've got it as a, the cycle track um, and, and using it, I suppose it's a balance of the the how, how much is interim in terms of how long do we plan to have that as an interim route, what the investment is in there and what the, the, the safety issues would be that we're maybe trying to address as well. Um, but it's something we can certainly have a look at. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'd like to members of the further questions for clarification. No further questions. Thank you. Councillor Delavaris Woodcock, opening statement. Thank you. We are very fortunate to have the Kaihu Valley Trail as a hero experience uh, on our books. And it's with great excitement that I um, speak to this item on the agenda. And I would uh, remind uh, the listeners and our elected members, this council and um, Mr. Mayor and our deputy, that 
MB have put out a report that in the past year, one third of New Zealanders have taken part in cycle tourism in the past year. And that 27% of the New Zealand adult population has participated in a cycle tourism activity in the past year. So we all know that human beings love novelty and we love new experiences. We also have um, an unstable global situation that's going to put the price of non-domestic travel out of reach to many. So it is really, really um, exciting that, that finally there is a destination activity for West Kaipara, for Dargaville, for Donnelly's Crossing. It's a 45 kilometre trail. It is a significant experience. And it is also exciting because we have this amazing uh, landscape, but also heritage of a uh, formative part of New Zealand's and Kaipara's economic and social and historical uh, development. And that all, all of these stories, all of this learning can be discovered and explored. So I'm just joyed in, uh, about the progress. And I, I can see, and we all know that it has been beset with obstacles and challenges, but like the, foot, the item before us, the challenges and the obstacles are where we learn and where we come together as a community. And I can see this happening. I, I would like um, the lifestyler to issue an apology for misspelling te hoanga marae, uh, because right there, that's that's one of the, the learnings that we all must do as a country, is uh, expand our knowledge and get to know ourselves and our history better. And I'm putting it out to the stakeholders, to the landowners of uh, the Kaihu Valley, that can they please um, find ways to, to compromise and to get their needs met so that they can continue to operate their business without interruption, but can they please bring their best selves, their collaborative selves to participate in this vision to make it happen? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kerno is the seconder here. Statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, just um, this this project is sort of as, as many complex projects end up being, you, you get into the sort of balancing of all the different needs. And what we have here is very much the balancing of the customer experience, which we all want to be extraordinary. Um, but also with the doability of the project, and um, as, as um, the previous member mentioned, we there have been lots and lots of challenges along the way. To my mind, the focus now really needs to be on delivering something so that we can start to feel, those involved can start to feel the benefits as opposed to just being told about the benefits. Um, and I think um, I would also stress that the placemaking and the marketing work that we have discussed even as part of our annual plan um, discussions, I think is going to be where we unlock those, those real benefits for our communities. Um, so I really do stress that that activity is so important, but we really need to focus on delivering something even though it's not going to be the all singing all dancing superb customer experience it starts and it starts to unlock this this whole experience so yeah um yeah good um godspeed to the team on getting getting things moving even faster thank you are there further statements from elected members Uh, no further statements. Okay, so uh, at this point, there's probably no need. Councillor De La Varis would talk for a closing statement from you to close the debate. Uh, yes, I would also like to um, ask that the project manager 
uh, puts on the calendar some community hui events so we can get our storytelling and get the community involved in the near future and can also elected members be included in the monthly newsletter update from Amanda Bennett that would be great thank you okay thank you right so we're putting this to the vote now on the noting of the report regarding the Kaihu Valley Trail all those in favor please raise your hand and say aye aye against carried thank you Thank you. Uh, so now we move to our next item, which is the Kaiwaka Footbridges project update. And I'm seeking a mover for this item. Councillor Peter Weathy, thank you. And a seconder here, Councillor Aaron Wilson Collins. Thank you. Greg, kia ora. Um, thank you, Worship. Um, nothing much to note since the, the report has been issued, obviously. I'll take it as read. Um, works are complete. Um, just to note that this is the final report that you will receive on the Kawaka Bridges. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions or clarification. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kurnow, question. So hopefully a really quick question, Greg. Um, the, the, the bridges are fantastic and the paths are great. Is there any um, landscaping or planting that's being done around them? Um, I would have to double check to see what has been allowed in terms of the landscaping and to what extent and I can come back to you on that. Yeah, yeah, just just to sort of, yeah, complete it. Yeah, um, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further questions for clarification? No further questions. Greg, thank you. You may stand down. Uh, Councillor Weathy statement here. Well, nothing, nothing really greatly. This is now completed. Those of us who were um, able to share in the opening of the bridges on the 26th of March and also the opening at McLean Park, I think saw what a fantastic uh, asset these bridges and the connection between the Kaiwaka village and the uh, McLean Park uh, has, has, has brought to Kaiwaka. I have no doubt at all that um, this will continue to uh, draw in a lot of uh, tourists and, and improve the prosperity of the, the village, uh, no doubt about that at all. Um, one thing that, of course, <clears throat> was the subject of discussion, certainly with me and, and uh, the likes of Willa Jean Prime, was the connection footpath between the south end of the, or the south bridge and the north bridge. And, of course, that's an area that has yet to be um, completed, and that's another project, obviously, in itself. But that's something that we shouldn't lose sight of. I think that that will add the extra dimension that um, will make both these bridges a lot more accessible to people. So I think the staff should keep that on the on the uh, radar, so that whenever we can find an opportunity to acquire extra funding, then we can progress that connection of the two bridges. But no, it's been a great project. Well done, staff. Um, and, and also, of course, we had a a, a very very um, uh, good and 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 um, competent um, bridge builder who put those bridges in, and I think that um, that made the project a lot more successful than it could have otherwise been. So well done, everyone. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, uh, Councillor Wilson Collins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, not not a lot further to add. Um, it, it's just really awesome to to see one of our projects actually come to to fruition, and and this one seemed to have been one that had less hiccups than some of our other projects. So so a nice a fairly smooth sailing compared to some of the the work that that the team is trying to do. Um, yeah, congratulations to to the team. Congratulations to the the community as well. Um, I I was fortunate enough to attend the opening of the bridges, and it was just so um, it was just so uplifting to see the community themselves turn out and 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 really be really excited about about this project for their town and and what what might come next and 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 how they can grow things from from here so a real success story i think um and mr mclean himself what a character um just really fantastic for to see him 
see his um, vision sort of lay out as well. So yeah, just just good feelings all round, and um, and and well done, well done, and thank goodness we've got something um, through the line. Awesome. Thank you, Councillor Vincent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm not too sure if it's modesty on his part, which has left Councillor Larson uh, not commenting on this, or whether he's actually listening. Um, but I, I do think that there was um, a lot of uh, the success could be attributed to his effort in securing the funding by getting it across the line, his perseverance in doing so. And um, I, I attended the initial blessing and, and, um, and uh, one other stage, but I was uh, a bit out of action when the actual opening happened, which I was a bit disappointed in. But um, no, I think it's been a great project. and. Um, at least something we can point to as a success. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, are there further statements here? Uh, a quick statement from me. Yes, picking up on Councillor Vincent's uh, comments there. Uh, this, uh, as has been noted frequently in the past, this uh, the funding for this, the PGF funding for this project, uh, was nudged along absolutely by Councillor Larson, and congratulations to him for helping secure this for the Kaiwaka community. Uh, but I'd also like to um, express a sadness that I have around this project, which is that uh, because the uh, launch event took place during the COVID period, uh, the numbers of people who were able to attend the launch was restricted. Uh, and family of Archie and Bessie McLean were uh, not able to attend uh, and were not invited to the event. Uh, they, of course, Archie and Bessie McLean had donated the first of the parks, which the first of the bridges that we opened uh, connects with. Um, and so those uh, family members, some of whom live in the Kaiwaka community today, uh, missed out on a, on, on a very, very special event. Uh, and uh, I, so I uh, acknowledge that for them and with great sadness about the family who were unable to attend uh, in this COVID era uh, and uh, certainly uh, acknowledge uh, the great support of all of the McLean family uh, in Kaiwaka town uh, and this extraordinary uh, set of bridges and parks and facilities that are coming through now. So um, acknowledging very much all of the McLean family there. Thank you. Are there further comments? Councillor Peter Weathy, back to you for a closing statement, if you would, if you choose. No, 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 nothing further from me. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I think everything's been said. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Putting this noting of this item to the vote now, all those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Against. Carried. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on now to the next of our items, which is the Mungify Shared Path. And we have Greg Monteith for this again, Councillor Peter Withy again moving this, and I'll happy to second this. Thank you. Um, thank you, Worship. Yeah, just to take the report again as read. Um, again, not much updates since the report, apart from the obviously construction works for phase one has been continuing um, and they're progressing with that. And there's still some aspects still to tidy up on that, but hopefully we will be finished shortly in the next month or so on those areas. And Moving on to the next phases. I'm happy to take any questions for clarification. Thank you. Question from me, Greg, is the clarification from Waka Kotahi regarding the phase two funding. Yes. Um, we have had approval from Waka Kotahi in the sense of it's gone to their board um, and we have the board's approved it. So now it needs to go to the CFO who and then has to further approve. The, the board's endorsement of it. And my understanding is that's just a, a technicality. Um, <clears throat> and I'm checking on the budgets and figures. So it's we are chasing up on that. And I did chase up this morning again, um, but I wasn't able to get an answer. I know from our operational steering group, which Steve uh, Mutton sits on, uh, was raised with him as well. And he's chasing it up with the CFO to see if we can get an answer on that. 
Um, but we are progressing on the basis of we've got the initial approval and the tenders out at the moment. So we're progressing um, in the tell tens of purposes that we've got the money. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. So, so just for the avoidance of doubt with this money, the total value of the Mungify shared path work is $11.41 million. Is that um, correct? That's because that's what we see in to date phase one and phase two. That's what yeah, we see yeah. in the papers. Yeah. 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 So they, they, what has been approved, I think, in terms of it was budgets for phase two and phase three have been approved, approved by Waka Kutahi. Um, so that that is greater than obviously the what's shown here in the report, but we haven't talked to the phase two or three of, um, in detail. But I think we my understanding is we've got about 14 million that was approved from Waka Kutahi. Um, so five point something million of that is for phase two. Okay, so so I would just like to say the what I would talk here, I'm going to use the phrase financial contributions of Waka Kotahi, not of our own, but it would be really great to have for the avoidance of doubt a single paper on one page where you have all of the lines of where the sources of the money are yep. coming from so that we can see it very, very clearly. Because uh because if you're now saying this out to phase three and it's a 14 15 million dollar project um th that's a sizable complete project uh and i'm concerned that members of the community uh may not be fully up to speed with how uh the size and scale of the value of what that work is um mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. of course the 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 dense the short length over which it sits and so on and so on so so perhaps just a new information paper there yep. for us for next for the next externally funded projects committee meeting uh so that we're just absolutely clear i think that would be helpful yep. thank um, you thank you we can certainly do that um just to we, we do have a paper coming to the council meeting that will hopefully provide a bit of detail onto that as well but we'll certainly come back at the next um um external uh, committee meeting with a bit more detail as well just to clarify on the report thank you thank you uh councillor Weathy question then councillor kerno thank you uh thank you mr mayor um greg on the um stage two this is the boardwalk and the bridge you say in the report that the nrc consent has been received uh and then that you're expecting the draft conditions for the kd's seed consent shortly although a building consent exemption has already been received. So could you perhaps uh, give us a bit more uh, information about the conditions that are likely to have to be met in terms of the KDC consent? Um, I don't know the top of my hand. I'd have to go away and double check to see what those likely draft conditions have been and to talk with the team. Um, but it will certainly be, I suppose, just of, it, it, it could be in terms of possible effects on adjacent properties, um, could be effects of possibly the lighting that we may put in or anything in terms of light spill that could be the, the amenities, um, um, environmental effects. There's there's a number of items, I suppose, that they could be looking at through the district plan that we would have to comply with. Um, so um, obviously we we would have looked at that as well as the team, um, but I'd have to go back and clarify of what, we, what we've done in terms of that due diligence of what that could likely be. Because certainly un under the uh, regional coastal plan, the any any uh, consent conditions that um, would be probably the most or the more difficult to comply with is likely to have been in the NRC consent, and we seem to have got through that process uh, yeah. relatively um, well. So hopefully we don't run into any obstacles in in uh, within our own consenting area. Okay. No, thank you. hopefully not. We we we're certainly um working closely with um the consents team to try and get that. I know, understand that they're possibly a bit short staffed on on resources, and there's there's consultants being used as well. So we certainly are working internally to try and um, get that pushed along as as quick as we can. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, Councillor Kerno. Question. Um. Yeah. It, it... I'm just going to add a little bit to the comments um, you made earlier around the phasing and the funding. Um, 
because it, to me it's incredibly exciting that phase three is also funded because I was or potentially funded because I was under the assumption that we were going to be working for a wee while to try and find the funding for that so that's great but I'm um, just looking at the map that we have in this report um, phase three is something is described as something else so it's just about yeah so in in your report that you bring through to us either to council or or next on this one if it could just be sort of lined up i know so things have moved moved on over time so yeah just so that we can get that phasing really clear about what's being done where and how it's being funded and and then what the gaps are because we're, we're gonna and also phase three is does that on on this map those i'm assuming there's that's the green bit from mangafai central through to the village but there's also a green bit from the um like up around the club area through to the head shops is that included in what you're describing as phase three or is that something else no i think that's included in phase three fantastic well they i mean that's incredibly exciting that we're we're going to be able to progress with that yeah thank you so again, for the avoidance of doubt, um, because we're very familiar with this map, Greg, you might want to yep. keep this map, which says what projects fitted where and regarding LTPs and so on and so on. But you might want to create a completely new map, different, that actually says this is phase one that we talk to, this is phase two that we talk to, and this is phase three that we talk to, which is yep. separate from the detail that's in this. Yeah. Yeah, we will do. Yeah. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Are there further questions for clarification? No further questions. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Weddy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, no, look, it's a, a very exciting stage. I think we're seeing um, uh, every week there seems to be another section of the uh, shared path up Molesworth Drive from the Causeway Bridge towards Mayors being completed. It's pretty well all complete apart from around the uh, two intersections with um, uh, Estuary Drive and Seabreeze Road. Um, I'm, I'm very heartened to see already uh, cyclists and runners and walkers using the um, concrete path that's already obviously set and is certainly structurally sound for them to use it now. So people are wasting no time in getting used to use the the path that's already been laid. So um, I think there's going to be a lot of community um, expectation that uh, our second and third stages are proceeding so that we can actually get a complete uh, walkway from uh, the village through to the Wood Street shops uh, up and running as quickly as possible because that'll make it a very, very um, good uh, cycle way, walkway, running way. It's it's going to be very, very good. It's, its name, a shared path, is going to be a fitting uh, name for such a an asset in the community. So I've heard nothing but positives about it. Um, and it's good because um, everyone ought to brace themselves for next week when um, Molesworth Drive shuts for six days. As I kid you not, <laughs> I've made the mistake of staying in Mungafai, not going away on holiday. But um, there's 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 a group of of the community who are not like that, and of course that part of the shared path uh, is something that um, in front of Mungafai Central, which and and this is something that Greg may take note with. Um, that is almost separate to, as I understand it, to the stage three because that is a deal that or. A, an arrangement between Mangafai Central and Council of who puts that in place. So there's quite a chunk of that which is green in the map, which is going to be put in um, by Mangafai Central. And um, that again, uh, the sooner that gets in, the better, because that'll add a little bit more to the community's appreciation of the construction work that's going on in that particular site. So the project team's working very well. I've still got a lot of admiration for um, the contractors doing this work, I think they've been uh, exemplary in terms of the way they've got on and done the work. You see them working on the weekends um, just to get the job done and to provide as little uh, inconvenience to the community as possible. So well done to Tim and all the rest of the project team. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, the thank you, Councillor Weathy, for your statements and in the local sense, the um, the community of Mangafai has been extremely patient uh, for a long time, uh, both with the absence of any uh, any of this kind of shared path work, but also during this construction period uh, that we've had and the delays during the COVID era. Uh, which have slowed down the project as well. Um, but I, I just like to yeah <laughs> congratulate the community on their patience and uh, remind them of the vision of the uh, the council here to be putting in place this um, this wonderful uh, leafy green spine right through the centre of Mangafai to ultimately be able to connect people all the way from the head surf beach right through to the domain. Uh, and the primary school. And so uh, the connections for all of Mangafai for, as a great future town um, it, it going to be much enriched and enlivened by this. The congratulations to Tim Manning uh, and the project team here, Greg, uh, regarding the, the uh, relentless uh, pursuit of standards and of the funding that is going in. Uh, and, and the funding from Waka Kotahi, which, as we know, is having a very challenging time right now. But where we have lined this up, or our project te team has lined up this project, is very much in line with the government's view regarding cycleways and walkway and uh, other forms of um, uh, transportation and mobility, um, rather than just mode shift they call it, rather than just people being in cars. So uh, so Kaipara District Council certainly grabbed this moment and this project, the fact that it's now uh, lining up to be a $15 million project for uh, what some people would call a footpath, uh, just goes to show the incredible scale of what is afoot here um, and the importance of this in Mangafai Town regarding uh, helping to organise the future of the place as well with it, with our placemaking. So congratulations, Greg, to you and uh, Tim Manning and the team uh, for what's going on here and all of the engagement uh, that's happening. Uh, this is going from success to success. Thank you. Councillor David Wills, statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the last one was down in Mangafai. I was driving back from down where the new development's going on and there was this lady pushing a push chair along that dirt track next to the road and i just thought it was amazing how the perception of mangafai as a rich area compared to the reality of its lack of infrastructure and then i drove up to the new um where it's where the progress was being made down to the causeway and my first reaction was how is that wide you could run a car down it. i hope that's not the activity that takes place but it is that wide um, if anybody's had the opportunity to go and have a look at it um one of the things I've realised, and I probably want to bring it up now, is, is that when we asked for funding from Waka Kotahi in the last round, we applied for a lot of footpaths and pathways. And we got declined on quite a number, uh, like um, the Kaihu Cycleway and stuff like that. And um, what we didn't fully appreciate was that they were directing funds at the change in transport within urban areas which Mangafai qualifies as. And so I just bring it up for the other councillors that while we should celebrate the amount of money we've got, please be aware that it meets all of their criteria for further funding. And there is in fact more money in the kitty for this sort of work. So don't, whoever carries the mantle on, don't back off on asking for more out of Waka Kotahi for footpaths that are in urban areas or cycleways. Mm -hmm because there is actually unspent money available even now. And I hope that our project team takes advantage of that knowledge and keeps hammering away and gets some of that footpaths and cycleways into Mangafai that it deserves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Further statements, selected members? Closing statement, Councillor Weddy, if you wish. Yeah, no, nothing further for me. Uh, I'm sure that uh, everyone's focused on getting everything completed as quickly as possible. So um, all speed ahead. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Putting this to the vote now, the noting of this report. All those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Against. <laughs>
carried. Thank you. Uh, moving on with the unsealed roading network uh, report. Uh, so I'm seeking a mover for this. Councillor Kurnow, thank you. And then Councillor Wills, thank you. Uh, Greg, thank you. Thank you um, again, I take the report as read. Um, numbers to update in terms of the works are progressing. Um, as noted in the report, the <coughs> um, contractors have, have been back up to full speed now. It was reduced down slightly um, just to the, the weather um, and the taking of water, but it's back up now and we are still on program to be finishing on May as, as, as scheduled um, and works are progressing well. I'm happy to take any questions for clarification. Thank you. Are there questions for clarification, elected members? No questions. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Uh, so, Councillor Kerno, statement. Um, just a, a short state from, statement from me. This is looks to be going exceptionally well. In um, yes, just congratulations for the team on working their way through this list and it, it's and I think it is notable personally I am getting fewer comments on roading coming through as constituent inquiries so I do think it's working from that respect um, that people are less bothered by our roading and that's good because much of what council does we would like it to be invisible and in that people don't even notice we've done it so hopefully this is um, having the effect that we want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wills. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm getting the complete opposite reaction to the previous councillor. I'm getting more <laughs> whinging from people whose roads haven't been upgraded under this funding process. Um, and they're actually ringing me up. And I got one last night where they gave me a specific number of truck and trailer loads of metal that they would be required to fix the job. Um, so I, there is a notice by those farmers or rural people that are moving about, they are actually ringing up to complain to me if their road's not on that list or that they haven't had the same work done on theirs, which is a compliment to the work that's been done today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further statements from elected members? Um, a quick statement from me on page uh, 13 of this report or page 59 of the agenda. There's a couple of pie charts um, which uh, and they indicate the um, the how, if you like, how the money has been applied. Um, and it's very, very interesting that nearly a third of the money to date has actually been applied for drainage work, not just the surface of the roads, but actually drainage work for culvert replacement and cleaning of cul um, culverts along the edge, edge of the roads and roadsides and so on. Uh, so that is fascinating to me because most people just, their comment is about the pavement on which um, they're driving. So uh, it's very interesting how uh, this work and all these millions are being spent very much on a giant engineering project. It wasn't as simple as throwing metal onto a road, gravel onto a road, and that'll be good. Uh, there's a lot more that's going on. So congratulations to the team for the work that's being done in the background. I'd also indicate that this project and the the project uh, uh, report monitoring report that we have for this is with all its green boxes has been consistently with green boxes um so so kurt martin is the project uh, manager and uh, uh the northern transportation alliance greg ha have just done a very very thorough job um andy brown and the team so on uh regarding the work that's happening in here the work regarding the center of excellence on on gravel road unsealed road networks inside the northern transportation alliance all of that comes through in projects like this so what i think i'll, I'll take the other comments from the other elected members and we we'll just say um yeah we got just uh, we need to carry on and do the rest of the network and we, somehow we need to get another 30 million dollars having proven this so that we can actually continue uh, fixing our roads in exactly the way this is happening now. 
uh, right across the district. But um, it's certainly uh, very, very good. And so congratulations to everyone. Yeah, thank you. Are there further statements from elected members? No further statements, Councillor Kernow? Closing statement, if you wish. Nothing to add, thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. So we're putting this item to the vote now. All those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Against. Carried. Thank you. Thank you. Right, uh, so we're moving on to Poto Road Phase 1. And uh, uh, Councillor Wills moving this. Thank you. And I'm seeking a seconder for this item. I'll second that. Thank you. Keep us moving along. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Worship. Um, sorry, just to to note on the last item. So I didn't want to interrupt. Um, Bernard Peterson of the he's hmm. the uh, maintenance manager who's been responsible for the delivery and then the workmanship on that along with Andy. So it's just yeah, it's um, I suppose down to his credit for the the, the smooth running of it and um, the delivery of it. So yeah. So, no Thank you. Sense. Apologies to Bernard. Sorry. Busy day. Uh, Poto Road Phase One. Um, yeah, just to take the report as read. Um, we're pretty much on the, the the back of this project now. Um, the, the the road is completely sealed. Um, we're just tidying up the last aspects of it in terms of the signage. Um, um, putting them in. I suppose there's some not delays, but I, I suppose we we couldn't design the signage until the road was sealed. So hence why it's just taking a bit longer to get the signs ordered. We had to ball bank it and drive the actual roads to get the curve advisory signs. So um, the, the team will be installing the signs at the moment um, or the posts and um, hopefully getting the, um, the curve advisory signs in shortly. Um, but all seems to be going well and we're just working on a, an opening date um, and a, yeah, a celebration. Thank you. Thank you. So, the, so what's written in the report here, which has an opening date for the 7th of April, um, it, of course, that date has already passed now, but um, there's still a date in the immediate future. Yeah, we, we we tentatively had one for the seventh of May. I thought it was, but it's um again, it's it's tentatively booked. We're just trying to work with all the um, stakeholders and people who are inviting to to make sure everyone can book there. But um, I have to follow up on that. Thank you. The seventh of May is a Saturday. Yeah. Okay. I will certainly follow up on. Update if I've got wrong. Sorry, it's also the opening of duck shooting season, so you know all sorts, <laughs> all sorts of things going on in the wee small hours on the seventh of May. Certainly, a lot of traffic on the road on that day, rather than any other particular morning of the year. Councillor Weathy, question <laughs> for clarification. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Greg, you might be able to um, uh, give me an update on the Green Hill Quarry. Now, that was, as you know, uh, a separate. Um, uh, funding allocation from council to open up that quarry to give um, the metal required for Potu One Road, and and um, it also had to be uh, restored back to a an agreed standard after the uh, quarrying had been completed. Could you give us an update on where we are with the Green Hill Quarry? Um, at this point, I, I, my, my understanding is that the quarry will remain open until I think the consent and the agreement is until the end of the maintenance contracts. Um, obviously, we we did additional work and and um, opening up and, and increasing productivity of it for Poto Phase One. Um, but it will remain in place until um, I think the, the consent is until the end of the maintenance contract. And I understand there's probably two years left on that. Um, I'm not. I haven't been privy to the conversations as of what's um, what's been agreed and and what's what will be what work will be undertaken. Um, and I, I I'm I'm not sure of where that sits at the moment. Um, um, I know uh, Jim when he was here was leading that, so I just I'm just not quite sure. Sorry. So so are you suggesting that metal coming out of that quarry over the next couple of years is going into unsealed road maintenance in general? Is it? It, it the, there is a consent for that, and obviously we've got Poto, um, the the lower half of Poto that will still use metal. So it, the intent is that we could still utilise the metal in there. We've got the consent for that. Um, my understanding was that was the the agreement. I suppose once the the consent had run out, then it would look to be um, restored back to some other state rather than a quarry. Um, and I understand there's a couple of years left on that. Okay, all right, thanks. Now just a and it, it, it's an important. Um, 
uh, thing not to lose sight of. We had a business case presented to us to grant the million odd dollars to open up that quarry. And it's been nice to actually see that we have actually been getting the savings that were um, built around that business case have actually occurred and um, not just been sort of, <laughs> we've got the money, let's just go and do what we want to do with it. So um, I, I'd like to see that loop closed at some stage where we can show that that business case was uh, accurate and we gave the right decision in granting the, the million dollars to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further questions for clarification? No further questions. Thank you, Greg. At this point, you may stand down. Uh, Councillor Wills, statement. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I just, um, I saw the last month's report update and I didn't do it publicly, but I challenged its accuracy because it had mentioned a significant amount more of the road being tar sealed than what had actually been done. Um, but I didn't bring it to Council's attention at the time. Um, this report, fortunately, is more accurate, having just driven over that road in the last couple of days. Um, and the feedback from the community that I spoke down to down at Poto 2 over the weekend, including farmers and that, they were all positive because it's taken from a 20 kilometres of rough metal to get to the point now down to a roughly 10 kilometres left, which you drive over in 10 or so minutes. And it makes it a lot less isolated community, but without encouraging a significant about more vehicles on that road going down there as a destination. And I checked the campground numbers and that, and they were at a similar level as they've been in the past. So that feared concern about a, a rapid increase hasn't taken place yet, admitting though that the tar seal has only just been completed. Um, so yeah, great to see and great to see that um, that we haven't had to put any more money in after all the previous injections. So I look forward to the final budget presentation and hope there might be even some possibly some recoveries. Um, yeah. But yeah, so uh, it, it's, uh, um, yeah, it's been, a, it, I know it's a little for those in, on the other coast that might not go to Poto frequently or regularly even, but it has been a huge boost for that community down the end of Poto. Um, so thank you to the rest of the council for your support over the last couple of years and helping fund the completion of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, quick statement from me is that this uh, is the longest sealing project in Northland uh, in the last decade. And, uh, and uh, we're very pleased to be at the end of this. Um, the it it is significant, and so the the team has done a, a good job. I'm I'm mindful that part of the road has a pinkish hue uh, in its colour uh, due to some of the aggregate, but that's what you get uh, when you're using local rock. And uh, so uh, just maybe uh, that will turn into a um, a selling point. People, instead of coming to see the pink and white terraces, they could come and see the pink highway to Poto. So um, the uh, the opportunity here, nevertheless, uh, for the community to be better connected uh, with the rest of the world uh, by the road is really important. And of course, we've got the upcoming project here as well regarding Poto Wharf, which is also increasing connections for this important place. So here's to better safety on these roads and here's to a project um, well done, uh, notwithstanding uh, all the challenges in the COVID era and inflationary pressures and so on. Thank you. Are there further statements? No further statements, Councillor Wills, would you like a closing statement in the debate? Um, the only comment I want to make is to reiterate my appreciation for the rest of the councillors' support in allowing this to be completed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So at this point, we're bringing this to a close uh, with the vote here. So all those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. Against. Thank you. That's carried. So that report is noted. Thank you. We'll move on to Poto Road Phase 2. Uh, 
And so this uh, for this item, I'm seeking a mover for the noting of this report. Councillor Vincent, thank you. And a seconder here. Councillor Kerno, thank you. Greg. Um, thank you, Roger. Um, I'll take the report as read. Um, the only thing to note, obviously, the, the design works are all complete now. Um, everything on this project has been completed, and this will be the, the last report um, that we present to the, the, the committee. Um, so it's now ready and, and packaged up, I suppose, just when the opportunity does arise that um, we, we've got the design and the, the documentation ready to, to jump in any opportunities for funding. I'm happy to take any questions for clarification. Thank you. We'll go to Councillor Vincent, then Wethy, then Kerno. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess uh, my question is, uh, what happens to the the underspend? Should any such thing happen, um, mm. is it possible that it could be offset against uh, Poto Stage One? Um, unfortunately, not. We, we we certainly had those discussions prior to coming to council previously um, and and seeking the additional funding for Phase One. Um, it was turned down, but we, we've currently got an application in to take the money from Poto Phase 2 um, to see if we can utilise that on Whitepool River Road um, as the second coat seal. Um, so that's currently being um, assessed by MB at the moment, um, and um, I think a, a, the decision has to be made by the Minister on mm -hmm. that, so we're, we're waiting on that coming back, but we're we're hopeful we can um, yeah utilise that and keep that money and use it on Whitepool River Road. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Weathy, then Councillor Kerno. Yeah, no, uh, Councillor Vincent um, asked my question for me, so I'll pass, thank you. Okay, very good, very good. Thank you, Councillor Kerno. then Councillor Delavaris Woodcock. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, Greg, um, great to hear that this is completed and now awaiting funding opportunities. What is the process by which we sort of keep, have a list of priority projects and identify funding. I just don't want it to kind of just fade away and sort of in 10 years time, someone goes, oh yeah, we had that, didn't we? We had that design. Yeah, yeah. You know I mean? and that, yeah and that's a very good question. I, I suppose it's all dependent on what opportunities present itself. And I suppose what's specifically usually from central government of, of where they want to direct funds and, and, and where they want in. Um, incentivize, I suppose, um, investment and, and opening opportunities up. Um, we obviously, through our asset team um, within the NTA, keep a, a close eye on all opportunities that come out of there and we get notified of them. So um, we will certainly take any opportunities we can to see if there's an option to to um, apply for funding um, and in what form that might take. I'm not sure if there will be council requirement on that or if it will be fully funded, but um, we would certainly look at those options and then bring that back to council and um, have that conversation. So do you have a, a list of projects that are, yeah, like the cabs on the rank, they're, they're ready to go, they just need funding? We do across yeah, the various councils, so we don't have many. Um, I suppose this is probably quite a large project that we've, yeah, um, mm -hmm. invested in and, and, and substantiated in terms of the design of such a, yeah, 10 kilometres of seal. I don't think we would have too many um, of that level. I think usually with our, our future projects ready to go or sort of smaller projects linked to the LTP that we know that are going to come online um, sooner rather than later and um, that maybe footpath works or it could be intersection improvements, smaller sort of ones that we design or the year or two before. But we're we're very conscious of, um, we try not to do too much in that because obviously um, the risk associated with doing the work and, and then having to go back and redesign. So it's there is a risk with that. Um, obviously, the risk of this one is still there, but it was um, the, the approval was given by AMB to carry on, and hopefully those opportunities present itself. And and yeah, maybe people don't spend some of their money, and we we get the opportunity to jump on that and just yeah take advantage. Okay, so you've got you've got a cab rank. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Great, thank you, Councillor Delavaris Woodcock. Thank you, Greg. My question is: Is there any? space and the criteria for some of this funding to be directed to improving the car parking area at the point because the wharf investment is going to necessitate improvement of that um, pedestrian access it's it's kind of uh, rather rustic at the moment so we, the we, two points 
Yeah. We certainly had the discussions early on um, the stage of this project with, with MB about um, when it was um, abundantly apparent that obviously the, the funding that was allocated wouldn't seal the full length. So we, we presented options of, of sealing the bottom half of, of the bottom couple of kilometres, working back from the wharf and coming up and, and doing that area and coming back as, as far as the, 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 the funding would take us. Um, that was again rejected. Um, so I think at this point, um, we could certainly go back and ask the question, um, but uh, we've currently got the application in for Waikol River Road um, for that. So we'd have to wait for maybe that to come to fruition first and then possibly um, have further conversations with MB. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further questions for clarification? No further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, and so we'll go now to statements. Councillor Mark Vincent, kia ora. <coughs> Excuse me, just as I pressed, unpress my mute button. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, this brings to end a rather sad story to me about what might have been but we've ended up with a plan instead. Uh, yes, the positive aspect of it is that should say we get to the last three or four weeks before the um, nationwide elections next year and somebody wants to um, attract the rural vote, um, they might say you've got three weeks to come up with a shovel-ready project and we can say, take that one and it's ready to go. So, uh, or some other funding opportunity that, that might happen along uh, some other reason um, why the government should uh, want to provide it. And so that, that's the positive aspect of it. But otherwise, um, yeah, I, I think that we should um, just reflect on what might have been, I guess, and ho hope that the opportunity will arise again. So um, thanks uh, to Greg and the team for getting it through to this point so that we can actually now draw a line under it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kerno. Nothing to add to my fellow elected member's statement. All right, thank you. A quick statement from me is, of course, uh, in whatever wonderful future we're headed towards for uh, Poto Road and the rest of the ceiling here, the design work which has now been done was always going to have to be done. Uh, and so the important thing now is that we are a couple of clicks along the road from where we would have been with a cold standing start uh, at, at any point in the future. And this is a much better prepared place to be, to be able to snatch, as Councillor Vincent said, uh, the next opportunity when it comes along. So uh, the the important thing here is that not all of the money went back and that that design study has been done uh, and because that is worth a, a great deal uh, of uh, planning dollars and time uh, as well. So uh, we'll be able to hit the ground running in such at such point in the future, whenever that may be um, here. But thanks to Greg and the team again at uh, uh, in, inside in, uh, the NTA for uh, their patience and work here. Are there further statements? Councillor Vincent, would you like a closing statement in the debate? Nothing to add, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you. So we're putting the noting of this report to the vote now. All those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Against. Carried. Thank you. Uh, we're just coming up to 12 o'clock. We were due to be concluding the meeting at 12.30. I'm aware now we've now been going for an hour and a quarter with no break. Uh, would you like another five minute break? Uh, no. Carry or on. you want to push on? Push on. on. Okay. Yeah, All right. Hold on. on. Right. That's clear. Thank you. Uh, so Waipawa River Road here. I'm seeking someone to move this item, please. I'll do so. Thank you. And then Councillor Delavaris Woodcock seconding that. Thank you. And Greg again. Thank you, Russia. Um, again, I take the report as read. Um, just the things to note, we have sealed Waipo River Road. It was sealed on the 11th of April. 
Um, and the works now are progressing on to the traffic signals and just installing them and getting them up and running. Um, and we are on track um, to complete those works, I suppose, in the, the next month. Um, yeah, as reported. So, um, yeah, happy to take any any questions for clarification. Uh, thank you. Councillor Withy, question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Greg, you might uh, like to comment. Um, one of the things that we haven't had any report of progress back in a positive vein, at any rate, is the um, discussions with uh, Doc and Tiroroa on the um, long term maintenance and potential vesting of that completed road. Uh, in, in the report, that, that line is actually given a green light. And yet the comment is ongoing discussion. So there seems to be a bit of a mix in the messages coming through there. But uh, have we got any further? We just seem to have that same, we seem to be stalled there at present. We don't seem to be making any progress. And now with the road basically being sealed and very nearly being ready for an opening, uh, it would be nice to have some agreement on what is going to, on who is going to, and who is going to fund the ongoing maintenance, et cetera, for that road. So could you comment on that, please? Yeah, um, with regards to the report, I will follow up on that. I, I suspect what it is there is the green light is is, is green lighted because the risk associated, associated to KDC is, is nil. There's no requirement in there in terms of KDC um, providing any money at this point or any commitment or in, in, in any of the contractual mm -hmm. obligations that we've signed with MB about undertaking that. Um, we've made it clear, and I think Council's made it clear previously, um, that at this stage there, there there is no appetite to be funding any maintenance from KDC's perspective. Um, the conversation is ongoing with, with DOC at the moment, um, and they're still sort of having a look at their, their options and costing in that, um, along with the application going into MB to try and help with that whole maintenance conversation. So I think the the, the the second coat seal is going to be, um, I suppose, in my mind, um, crucial really to, to help push that conversation along. So if MB comes along, I think there's there's definitely more opportunity and more um, possibly appetite for, for Doc to come into that conversation. But at the moment, obviously, they're they're looking at the dollars um, and it's just, a, it is it is taking slower than, than what we'd hoped. Um, and we are sort of progressing that up. I suppose it's up to, to Louise to, to have those conversations just to see, yeah, what what are the, the, the um, the issues and, and what's the, the taking so long, I suppose, to progress it. Um, from KDC's perspective, I suppose that there is no risk in, in terms of maintenance and there, there is a defects liability on the road setting. So it's it's under that for the next 12 months, I think, um, with the current contract. Um, so there is still a little bit of time to, to be working with that, um, which we hope to, to try and get some resolution in that part Obviously, of in, in, any any thoughts of that road being vested in council, which was certainly something we talked about in the early stages of the project, would not occur until there'd been a satisfactory resolution on the ongoing maintenance situation. I'm yeah, sure. I, I think that's certainly the part of the conversation, and it's it, from my from my understanding, I suppose con council's been very clear of they at this point um, they they don't want to be. Um, Taking on that that maintenance responsibility, um, and, and unless I've, I've picked that up wrong, um, so I think it for me it, it's 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 having that conversation with Doc and just being very clear of what their opportunities are and what they can bring to the party. The second coat seal, and then having the conversation of like this is where we stand, um, and and um, yeah, putting the options on the table. Um, yeah, I, I suppose worst case scenario, it, it it's we 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 hand the road over <clears throat> at the end of defects back to um Tiroa. And and they they carry on with Doc to, to work out those maintenance issues. Thank you. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. You and your final sentence there. Uh, you've answered my question, Greg, regarding that situation that we're exactly in right now because council has never owned the road. Yeah. So, um, are there elected members? Are there further questions for clarification? No further questions. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the uh, Waipo River Road, this is the very, very edge of the district. Um, and uh, uh, I'm very pleased this project is is coming to its uh, conclusion uh, with a grand opening event in the very near future. Looking forward to finding out when that is going to be. And um, having Kaipara District Council's first ever set of traffic lights 
within our of formal traffic lights within our rohi, uh, which ironically are in the middle of the bush. It's like, how does that even happen? But there you go. So um, that's what this project represents. Um, it is an extraordinary engineering feat. Um, and uh, so uh, looking forward to that within the next few short weeks. Um, and congratulations to the team uh, on, on this uh, job done. I'm looking forward to seeing it uh, uh, in its completed state. Uh, having watched it as it's been progressing. So thank you to the team, uh, the roading team here and the project management team. Uh, Councillor Delavaris Woodcock. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is a great project, the Waipoa Te Nahire or Waipoa. The forest is an amazing place and it is with a feeling of tinged with sadness and joy that I go to that area because it gives us an insight into how New Zealand Aotearoa was uh, before so much of our forest was cut down and felled and our, our, my, our mighty kauri in particular and that's part of our history and so it's good to see this uh, development, this improvement to access the important visitor experience there at the um, Te Rorua headquarters. And uh, it was with some challenge to get this project over the line. There was um, concerns about road ownership, but the important thing was that we got the contingency fund and the project has gone ahead and we can see it taking shape. Despite COVID and weather, it will get there. So. Great. Thank you. Are there any further statements? No further statements. Thank you. So we're putting this to the vote now about noting this report. All those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Against. <laughs> Carried. Thank you. So, uh, Greg, thank you for your attendance at today's meeting. So far, you may be staying on in the background, but thank you across those reports that you've just led us through. Um, thank you for your input here. Uh, moving on to the Kaipara Wharves project, the next of our projects here. Um, and I'm seeking a mover for the noting of this report. Councillor Wills, thank you. And a seconder for this. Councillor uh, Wilson Collins, thank you. And we'll go to Eros Foschieri. Okay, so we're here. So, uh, in terms of photo worth, and so, so both worth is pie is now completed, so it's left in the status report um, because these are uh, is, is a package. So, moving forward, we'll just leave the pie wharf as complete and day and we'll focus the status report on port to wharf in term of port to wharf following the the decision made last week the team has moved forward and lodged both resource consent and the building consent so it's moving forward in that respect and uh, is now running in into the detailed design phase uh, the only risk at the moment that we foresee uh, the procure is, is the procurement of the material that is outside of our control due to the international mood. And uh, and what, what we're doing at the moment is we're, we were meeting with, with the contractor and the designer to see if any opportunity in terms of value engineering. So making sure the design is sound and we got a good, a good lead ahead. So that is, uh, yeah, in term of time frame, as I said, we are on track. So this is in nutshell, the Paul to Wharf status. Any specific questions? Thank you, elected members. Are there questions for clarification? <laughs> Councillor Wills, then Councillor Weddy. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Hi, Eros. Um, you say we're on track. Which track is that? Like, um, what's the what's the absolute final completion date before we lose MB money now? 
Give me a sec, I'm just going to look at the program here, so I don't have the top of my head, but it's in the program, so in the, give me just literally a second, I'm looking at uh, Wolf is opening evening Pol 2 construction commencing in Pol 2 May 2022. Um, I need to pass this question to Zisha. I will, I will respond back when I got the information on top of my hand. So what I've been told by the team is now that detailed design is uh, need to be completed in three weeks and that will bring us into the program so i can't respond that at the moment i will follow um, the question david sue uh, davidson uh, kia ora kia ora through the mayor um yeah we we have to apply for an extension so that's the next step with mb because i was going to say that the, the timeline suggested in your report are unfeasible considering we're about to go into winter so that's when you said we're on track, I, I'm, I'm challenging that. Um, so we don't have guarantee of funding despite our approval of the extra money. So. That's correct. This has been, we're um, doing it at the same time. We're applying at the same time to MB. So just help me with my time frames here because this is a, such an ongoing thing and we're, um, we're not going to get it built over the winter period. I mean, from a practical perspective, there's a public consultation aspect required because of the changed location. Are we going to do that consultation before or after we are assured that MB will give us the money or give us the extension? So, so what we've done is we've gone to MB and we've um, had had discussions with them, and they. As a chicken and egg, they wouldn't approve the extension until they knew they had the money. We got the extra funding. So now we're just about to, well, we've told them we've got the extra funding, but um, we're waiting to hear on what the extension will be for this project. So, yeah, we'd hope to hear within the next couple of weeks and then do the consultation. So, well, sorry, I'll, um, thank you for your answers, but I'm just trying to get some under confirmation, concrete knowledge. Does that mean that the consultation will take place? Like, are you progressing these things all in tandem, hoping that we get an outcome? Because of the previous efforts to stage them, to do the consultation, then the project, then the MB, means that we've lost almost, what is it, a year? And like, we've, we, we keep losing months at a time. Is there any way to condense it down so that we're doing those different aspects simultaneously? So through the, the mayor, we've um, look, just appointed a new um, project manager. So she's, um, that's Diane, Diane Miller, and she's looking at um, all these items and we'll progress them and make sure that we can do them within the, the um, project timeline. So I can't give you a straight answer on that at the moment, sorry. Okay, oh, well, no, thank you. At least thank you for the, the honesty of, it's, it's, um, it's disappointing, I guess, but I, I'll leave the question. I, I, the questions have been answered because, I mean, we I misunderstood and thought we were about to go into that last phase of public consultation to get an agreement on that changed location, but that is not actually the case at this stage. Oh. Yeah, I'm just unsure. Sorry, can't answer that. Uh, Thanks. Thanks, Sue. Sorry. Mayor, are you still there? Um, it looks like we're confused him so much more. I question his. <laughs> <laughs> we lost the mayor. Um, yes. So, um, okay. So we were. Whose question were we on? It was David. We're just finishing. I just asked the question as to we'd been indicated that the consultation would take place sooner rather than later and i was asking if that's still the case or not because we're trying I'm, I'm personally trying to generate participation by the community with regard to the change location and i'm just wondering if that's pointless at this point if we if that we have to wait weeks before we can even make a plan to have a consultation date you can't answer it The mayor is on his way back. So I guess the question is, 
are we doing more consultation? Because my understanding from reading the report was that maybe we weren't. So if we are, when is that likely to have been happen? Or if we're not? So at the moment, neither I and Sue can probably answer the question. So we'll take on, we'll take internally and we'll provide a question shortly this week, but okay. I cannot don't have that information. Okay. Okay. Back to the mayor who has uh, returned. Uh, thank you. Sorry, my internet crashed around me here completely badly. And so I've now ended up with two WebExes open here. So some major IT failure. I apologize for that, everybody. Councillor Weathy, next question, please. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, um, Eros, going back to Pahi Wharf, um, I see that through a, a, an omission, uh, the license to occupy with the boat club has, has not yet been uh, completed. Uh, it's it's given in your report as a high risk red high risk to council. Uh, is that correct? It's a license to occupy. The only reason it would be read, in my opinion, is if the boat club had given indication that they weren't going to sign it. Good question. Uh, again, I need to pass to the PM. Apology for my mm -hmm. lack of knowledge of this. Uh, I so. Talking with the book club, I haven't heard any major problem with that, and so might be incorrectly flagged as red. Mm. So I will okay. again. I Please will take... clarify that because it's just giving the wrong signal at this stage. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Kerno. Your hand is raised again. Um. Yeah. Yes. I just a sort of similar question. The the um the license to occupy and the maintenance and the the. <laughs> cost of maintain that's all going to be wrapped up in that license to occupy the maintenance of that wharf so we yeah when we exactly get that is part of the of the world agreement yeah right okay thank you thank you thank you are there further questions for clarification no further questions thank you sue thank you eros uh councillor wills is the mover here? Thank you for statement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't know what to say. I thought after our last meeting, it was we were all go, and now we've just been put on halt again. Um, so it's probably best if I don't say what I think and just leave it there. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Wilson Collins. Nothing further to add. Thank you. Further statements from elected members here. Uh, quick statement from me. Uh, I'm very hopeful here regarding the Poto Wharf opportunity, especially considering we just had an extraordinary council meeting just last week on this subject. Uh, and uh, the lead from the elected members of the council here is clear and from everyone associated with the project and I'm just very hopeful that this will continue to come through mindful that it is the winter season and so construction is very very difficult because the ocean becomes uh, ex uh, uh, extremely challenging in that location uh, and the, um, the but the space and the opportunity is right there uh, within our grasp and I'm hopeful that MB is aware of that uh, and just how far we've already come uh, on this project. Uh, so, uh, yes, best wishes to everyone uh, in securing the rest of the uh, aspects of the project and confirming the project here. Thank you. Uh, are there further statements? Thank you. No further statement from you, Councillor Wills, to close us. No, no. All right. Thank you. We're putting the noting of this to the vote. All those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Against. Carried. Thank you. Uh, we're moving on now aye. to the Dargaville to Tikopuru Stop Bank Project update. And I'm seeking a mover for this item, please. Councillor Wilson Collins, thank you. And a seconder for this. 
Councillor Vincent, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Eros, Kelda. You are again. Uh, okay. Uh, so we've just completed with the consultant all the geotechnical investigation and preliminary in the concept design. So we have a, a, a month delay due to the investigation taking longer than expected. Now, there is an end. Uh, I, okay, I finish here. And uh, now we're working with the consultant to, to prepare for the detailed phase. So we're looking at recovering this month in the detailed phase and this should be three or four weeks uh, ahead where we engage the consultant to to carry on with the detailed design phase so at the moment we're looking at a month delay and the budget is is under control thank you councillor uh kerno question then councillor withy thank you mayor um, yeah, I just uh, on on the first page of the actual report, not the agenda report. So page ninety five of the agenda. Um, the I'm, I'm just slightly confused about the comment about budget, um, the, where the consultant's original estimate has been increased. But it, I'm just slightly confused as to what's happened with that and how much is the difference. So, okay, we can hear you. So what normally happen is in term of work, until we don't have uh, pretty much the money in the pocket and we can award the contract to, to any consultant, we have an estimate from the consultant that is not always mm -hmm. secured. So especially in this environment right now, if we change three or four months, the consultant may pull out or change resources. So the cost may increase because you don't get the exact resource now we get maybe a, a more senior person one before we had a graduate to do the job because they're not available so the difference between the time we we actually get the offer or the quote we can call it this and, mm -hmm. and the time frame is, is the difference so there's been around in the past that i think was in the report state as fifty thousand dollar give me both park has been negotiated to 34 mainly around uh, that and in this case also because they are geotechnical investigation we got to mobilize equipment and again the equipment can be mobilized when we want so if we're not fast in booking this this equipment that means committing to the job these are the risks that we're taking so this cost increases is a little bit of this factor to put together this is why now we're negotiating the new uh, offer of service. So we had an indication previously by the consultant for the detailed design phase. <laughs> now we are re, re, we can call renegotiation of this offer of service to make sure that we line everything up. We got that. So, so it was going to be. So what was the original estimate and what is it now? The original estimate was uh spent today 77 so i believe okay so this report is not clear so the original estimate was about one hundred and seventy thousand dollars for the design Invest mm -hmm. here, investigation is written 205 so it was about 170 they came back with fifty thousand dollar more we renegotiate and work out through and this came up about two hundred thousand dollars i apologize don't have the right specific okay number. So they came back saying they wanted another 52,000 and we negotiated that down to 34 um, to 30 34 so the actual cost for the design is going to be around 200 the 200 205 yeah this is the phase we just completed yeah okay and that's okay that's now complete cool all right, thank you. I'm much clearer now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Weathy. Then Councillor uh, Wilson Collins. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> yeah, just sort of following on the same theme as uh, Councillor Kuno here, Os. In your, in your, when you've getting down into your uh, colour coding risk factors, you've got the risk that the budget may be overrun due to the escalation on fees, as, as you've just explained. Now, in your comment, you say being tracked and managed where possible. Now, I think 
those words are, are not, I don't think, as advisable to be used. This is a public document. And if we put aside all of our projects, we're going to manage the budget where possible. Um, I don't think it would go down particularly well with the community. So I think we've got to be careful about how we phrase our wording on, on comments like that. Um, in my experience, if there is an overrun, as you've just explained, on the consultants, you know, the 34 odd thousand, the first thing I'd be looking at doing, if I was the project manager, is making sure that we found $34,000 worth of saving in the construction cost or somewhere else. So we still were within the budget. And that's the sort of uh, discipline that we as elected members are seeking that staff uh, engage in. Uh, and then at the very last resort, if there is every possible uh, avenue has been explored, there is an overrun, then you've got to come up and front up and look at um, getting a uh, some sort of um, extra funding for the project to cover any overruns. Because the question that I immediately ask is if we do, if we are in the unfortunate position of finally having an overrun on this project, where is the funding going to come from? Yeah. If the question is if you got an overrun, it's written in the contract that is highly likely required from this council. So an overrun in this project will be incurring council costs. Or alternatively, you've built in the project costs the contingency that will be sufficient to absorb such overruns and consultants and design fees of the thirty-four thousand dollars. Because that's the other thing we have been not necessarily as robust in some of our project budgeting is to have adequate contingencies, as we've found out to our detriment in some of the projects uh, already that have been covered today. So just another thing going forward, let's learn from some of these experiences so that we uh, don't make the same mistakes. Yes, in that, in that respect, I want to launch a little bit of a consideration here that when we went to MB with the scope, we asked for 10 million. We've been given 2.8 or 3.8, so depending on which project you like, you look. So this is a less on, the, or it's almost a quarter of the project, of the fat of the budget that we have. So now with the consultant, we're trying to work out what is actually buildable uh, mm. with that. And is I mean, we had a plan. We asked a million, we're giving 2.5, 2.6, was a different number. So now we're trying to work, no, we're trying. We are working with the consultant to actually came out with a, a feasible scope that is meaningful for the future as well. We're not just yeah. building, I don't know, 50 meters of stock banks because we got this money. We try to put the, I would say, to put the foundation. So if in the future more funding is coming through, we can start from where we left and not starting from scratch again. So that is also another, I understand, take your point and we'll obviously consider in the future report, but this is the difficulty that we're facing now that we have the budget that is being slashed compared to what yeah. has been asked. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wilson-Collins, question for clarification. Hey, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hi, Eros. Um, yeah, just a quick, hey, just a quick question on page three of the report about the enabling works um, and the three month, there's been a three month variation verbally granted by MB. And my question is is just about the, the, the baseline completion dates and the expected completion dates are a lot more than three months different. So can you just Explain to me how that works. So my understanding again from, from, from talking with the PM is that the the, cons, the cons start of the so what with the definition if the construction is when we got the so the enabling work is pretty much building the roads, building all the infrastructure that will push us to build the stop bank in effect. So uh talking with MB as long as we don't change the construction and then we can work out when the enabling work will happen. So it's pretty much wiggling around. That's the phases of the work. So we push on on the on the enabling works because we need more time to, to complete the detailed design. Again, in light of that, we need to rescalp everything. We need to make sure that we we are then taking the work that actually needed. Example, are we going to raise the, the bank in, un, uniformly of two meters per se, or we're going to build the foundation on a wider foundation of 30 meter now, and we just don't raise pretty much a thing. 
So this is still, obviously, this is an extreme at the moment, but we are working on and this taking time. So we just completed the geotechnical investigation right now. So we got a picture of what the stock banks looks like in detail this time. We don't just have a, a broad high level view. So this, this, this is why we moved the enabling works three months ahead as well as looking at the, the season, because there's another problem is not a problem, but we need to consider when we're going to build, because there is no way we're going to build in winter. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Eros. There are no further questions for clarification from the elected members. So uh, at this point, we're going to go to Councillor Wilson Collins for her opening statement here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, so just yeah, another another project that we're trying to to limp through with all these challenges that that we keep facing. Um, I just I just want to um, say that I feel the staff's um, frustration. I feel is coming through today about the challenges that they're constantly being rammed up against. So I just yeah, I just want to acknowledge um, what the team is actually trying to work through with all with all these different projects and, and, and this one in, in particular, with having only received a fraction of the funding that was required to even complete the job as 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 it was wanted to be done. So just a, a, an appreciation, thank you, and um and an acknowledgement and and just yeah, I'm I'm hearing I'm hearing all those challenges and just hoping that we can surmount as many of them as possible. Um yeah, best of luck, team. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vincent. Second statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I'll just endorse uh, what the mover had to say. The, the motion is the noting of the report, and I have no trouble supporting that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Are there any further comments here? No further comments. Thank you. We'll, uh, we'll bring this to the vote now. So all those in favour? of noting this report, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Against. Carried. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, we go now to the Raupur stock bank item, uh, which is the last of our projects for consideration for today. Uh, and I'm seeking here a mover for the Raupur upgrade project item. Councillor Kerno moving that. Thank you. And a seconder here. Councillor Vincent, thank you. Eros, buongiorno. Che ora, buongiorno. Um, okay, so Raupo. Uh, Raupo, we is the, at the moment we, we are a little bit of a chicken egg situation, like Sue was mentioning before regarding the MB. So we went down on the panel, on the professional panel to in the past, probably four months ago, five months ago, to request a system from our consultant. One was not available due to the resource and the other two applied. Um, so, but during the course of the negotiation, we found out that I mean, in terms of tender, there was a lot of, uh, we had to do a lot of work in the tender phase. So that took us two, two months approximately to, to even come to a, a, a tender evaluation so that push the delay i'm just giving you the background in case you have not been aware of so and then i bring to, to today date um so at this point in time the program the consultant couldn't um, submit a conforming tender in terms of uh, program so we had to renegotiate the program now we are again another stage of evaluation with the with the consultant but the program is out so we're not we obviously we can achieve going back to david willis to david comment on the program for the other project we have an unachievable timeline uh, we can't start in january i think the moment is january so we are negotiating with mb for an, an extension of the program they are willing to discuss about that but at the same time we need to have a consultant ready to rock if the new program is awarded is, is 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 agreed so we are this week we're rushing in the tender evaluation so we got we will select a consultant that is the aim of this week and making sure that the program 
is feasible for the consultant. So we'll liaise with the consultant to make sure that the program is bulletproof. Then the next phase, we're talking with MB and agree on the program uh, and make sure that and get the extension. So um, in terms of budget, we haven't spent much because again, we are still need to award the project to a consultant. So at the moment, it's all about making sure we get a consultant on board first, and this can deliver the job as agreed. And the current program is, is not achievable. Okay, thank you. Councillor Delavaris Woodcock, question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, so it's kind of similar to the last item, but my question is about the the 121,000 from the report over budget for the consultation fees is not looking good when we still haven't got the contract finalized. So how, what certainty, Eros, can you give us that this project can be met and achieved without having to use ratepayer funds? As I said, this is, a, the, the, is the same as the Kropuro, where we ask a lot of money and we'll be given a slice of it. So, I, what I can say is once we got the consultant on the table and we got an appointed consultant and an agreement with MB, we can have more confidence what we can, we can deliver within budget. At the moment, we haven't the consultant on board that actually they need to prepare the design. Uh, we also looking at different way of procurement. Uh, I don't know if I can disclose now, but there are different ways of how we can procure the work and get some value in engineering around the procurement and how we design. So we are exploring those options. Uh, so that will be another venue where we can get a bit get a bit firm on the budget. At the moment, we haven't started the design, so I can't. The only thing I can say that we. We, we design to the budget we have. With with this project, the the environmental impact hasn't been done yet. Is that correct? So that is part of the design. So we part of and that part of the delay is during due to the, the flood modeling. So obviously we put a big flood. The scope of the project is essentially to build a big flood gate. So definitely impact assessment and, mod and flood modeling is key part of the job. So modeling and geotechnical are the two major risk opportunity, depending on the look that of this project. So with the Dargaville to Tecopera stock bank, if the consultants fees or whatever, you know, in mid project, if if there is a re-evaluation of costs because of our inflationary environment or shortages, you know, that the progress of the works can be halted in order not to have to have ratepayer dollar be spent to finish it. Whereas I am concerned that this project, because it's a floodgate, once we've committed to it, if if these uh, the environmental in impact and the flooding modeling and and the the sort of feasibility part of it, design project part of it goes ahead and then we approve that. Once we've started on this, how if we as every single one of these projects has come in over budget and with escalating costs, it, it seems Am I right that it seems certain that this is going to be exactly the same? Because right from the get go, that you know the amount that we needed what was for two canals to be floodgated, but this is just one. You know the two point five million from the what I'm hearing from you, you're talking about that being insufficient, and we haven't even started. Okay, so one by one. So in terms of if this project will go over budget, obviously I like to bring good news, not bad news. So we are working toward to that. So only time will tell. 
internally we just need to manage the risk we need to make sure that we got good contractor good consultant practical people on the ground and we're working with the community that is rap has been always a good community to work with because they know better than us down there what's happening uh, for, in terms of inflation in terms of budget we can call increased say last year probably we will be a a little bit of a surprise this inflationary market because no one not knew around COVID what could happen and put a factor of 15 20 percent of top of each project will probably be in a little bit disaster coming to you and says this will cost you 20 percent because this may happen i don't know how how much was probably good digested but in this market at the moment we we definitely we need to factor inflation we need to factor uh, risks especially cost risk that we already experienced so in the moving forward we'll put a big weight on this risk so it's not a new now we, we might see that inflation is keep stating at six seven percent so if we got a contingency of 30 percent give or take we know that six percent will already be chewed by this inflation next year so we need to plan for a 36 percent contingency from what I'm trying to get here so the only thing I can say is we are we are we are proceeding step by step, not not over committing. Like now we are talking with the consultant instead of going to an MB, plan for an unachievable program and get the consultant on board. This way we're trying to proceed the other way around, try to get the consultant on board, agree with them, get everything on the paper until MB is, is okay, and then we sign the contract. So we get a little bit of wiggle room. We're not starting with the wrong fit foot um so that's the reassurance i can give you at the moment so it's, uh... thank you that's clear thank you we'll go to councillor kerno then councillor vincent thank you thank you mayor i'm i'm not sure whether my question is for eros or for sue um but if there is an overrun does this fall into the targeted rate or the general rate I will pass to Sue this one. <laughs> Sue, are, are you there? Are you able to answer? Um, yeah, I think um, we'd have to have that discussion at council as to where they saw it falling because we haven't specifically looked at that in the past. So um, at that t at the time we look at it, we'll bring it up as both options and the merits of both. Um, as Teddy Kennedy said, you cross that bridge when we'll come to it. Yeah, and it could be any it could be a mix of of the two in some ways as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Vincent. You got my joke. Thank you. It's in poor taste, but nevertheless, Councillor Vincent, over to you for a question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think. Um... G Canal is a lot easier name to pronounce than the bridge that you were referring to, I believe. Um, Capaquitic. Uh, yeah, that's the one. Um, okay. Uh, I'm just getting a, a, a clear handle on the scope of this pro project, indeed how the scope has changed. Originally, the concept was, as I understand it, existing um, uh, stock bank network is about 70 kilometres, and by the um, placement of two large uh, floodgates, we could reduce that to uh, 30 kilometres so that in terms of future proofing the scheme, there was a, a lot, it was a more sustainable solution. Um, we would have a, a greater area of land protected by a smaller distance of, of stop bank. Um, so the the report, so it sort of glossed over, but didn't realise it only refers to just uh, G Canal as the one that's going to be installed. So, how much stop bank is that going to mean that won't have to be uh, maintained in future? So, regarding the scope, so and then I go yeah. to the stop banks. Uh, so, the initial scope probably backdated when St John's came in Kaipara was for two gates for so sorry for two set of gates one in G, uh, G canal and K canal so both canal were targeted 
the idea was also to provide for water storage for fresh water. That was the initial initial concept long time ago. Then after that, the money came through. We got less than expected, than requested, and uh, and now we went to only G Canal. The idea initial idea again was to put a flat gate and a slush slush gate, so two gate one after the other one to 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 avoid silt the position. So the idea was kind of that between the two gate, there were we were holding water and flush. Now we're moving to one gate only uh, and then we'll pretty much will save this will save us all the defense on the g canal i'm confusing the canal at the moment but the big canal we're not going to provide we don't need to provide defense as a stock banks on this canal the exact length i don't know but this canal is the biggest one so if it's not 70 it will probably be 50 because you need to consider also both sides. Also, you got 25 and 25 k. So you need to defend both sides. So the scope now is a flat, a flat gate for GKNet. Hopefully that responds to the question. Thank you. Okay. So uh, for the next meeting, Eros, it would be good. And as your design comes through to be exactly explicitly clear how many salt water facing kilometers of stock bank are going to be reduced yeah so that we are absolutely clear when you have a precise location for where the stock bank would be ah, yeah, sorry with we'll this special floodgate would be in g canal we're providing the status report as, as an item there as a response in there if it's the right location Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that way, then we get a handle on the extent of the benefit that is going to be achieved by this um, program. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further questions for clarification? No further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Eros. Uh, Councillor Kerno. Um, yeah, it, it's sort of it's another one of those projects that um yeah you, you it starts off fan, fantastic and what oh. we're actually doing is is much smaller but hopefully um in the next report we'll actually get a much clearer picture of what the actual benefits are going to be and as i've said before this is a project that for decades um the the eminent gentlemen of the rapo drainage committee have been talking about the fact that this is a way to reduce the amount in, in some ways reduce the amount of work that's involved in looking after the network because it reduces the length of um, stock banks that need to be maintained in that way um i'm i'm concerned by what i had that and, and i'm not sure if i'm right and eris might add this into his report that the silting up is not going to be reduced because the silting up is one of the key issues. It's not just the maintenance of the stock banks, it's actually trying to reduce the amount of silt that gets into the canal network. Um, so yeah, it would be really good to get clarity on whether that is going to, is that still a benefit that we're looking for or not. However, I have great confidence in um, the members of the drainage committee to help the consultant and the contractors and everyone else involved to design the best possible solution that we can get to with the money that's been provided. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Vincent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I have some good news to offer Councillor Kerno as far as sediment is concerned in that we now have a Kuiper Moana remediation program and an essential building block of that is for individual land holders having a property of more than 20 hectares, they have to have a silt management plan, which may or may not include planting stuff, but the intention is by whatever means to reduce the amount of silt coming into the harbour and thereby restoring the health of the harbour. And one of the ancillary benefits may well be less maintenance of the uh, drainage networks uh, in the catchment, not just in the Raupo area, but with the amount of silt that's actually um, uh, dynamic in the system. That is my cherished hope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further statements from elected members here? 
No further statements. Thank you. We're putting the noting of this report to the vote. All those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Against. Carried. Thank you. Uh, those points are all clear for Eros. Thank you. So at this point, we're going to the penultimate item for today, which is the financial overview on these projects. And so Eros, again, leading us through this item. And I'm seeking a mover for the financial overview item. Councillor Kerno, thank you. And a seconder here. Councillor Wilson Collins. Ah, oh, Councillor Joyce Punky, thank you. Councillor Kerno and Councillor Joyce Punky. Uh, Eros, buongiorno. Buongiorno. Uh, so I so I can only speak on the non-roading project because otherwise I will probably pass the ball to Greg if he's still here. In terms of finance, uh, the only item that has changed at the moment is flag as red is Paul to Wolf that obviously is now changed with the with the decision last week. So now that should be light as green. As mentioned before, uh, in terms of the, the Copuro and, and Raupo, we still at the early stage. We're tracking the budget at the moment is under control, but will be and that will be tested in the next few months. And apart from that, I can add more than what has been discussed already in the previous meeting, the previous um, sessions. Thank you. Are there questions for clarification? No questions. Thank you, Eros. Uh, Councillor Kuno. Nothing, nothing to add, Mayor. Uh, Councillor Joyce Parkey. Nothing from me. Okay, thank you. Quick statement from me. I'd just like to remind everyone uh, that this represents more than $41 million worth of projects for this council, which is basically the equivalent of an entire normal year's operation of everything council does. Is, is what is represented here. Uh, so uh, it's an extraordinary uh, quantity of these externally funded projects uh, and that at present, according to this indication, the budget spend to date is at 55%. So we are, we're trucking on, but, uh, but uh, it's a very, very uh, important piece of work. So thank you. No further statements from elected members? Thank you. We're putting this to the vote now. All those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Against. Carried. Thank you. Thank you. And now our final report for today is the program overview as against the financial overview, but the program overview for this. I'm seeking a mover for this item. Thank you. Councillor Wilson Collins, thank you. And then Councillor Kuno, thank you. Buongiorno, Eros. Ciao. In Italy, we say salve when it's the formal, and then it is ciao when it's the. Um, okay, so as per uh, the finance, uh, I cannot really comment on the no, on the voting project, I will leave to Greg again, has been discussed previously. Uh, the last two projects that are Wolfis, Dargaval, Tecopolo, and Raupo upgrade project. Uh, again, Poto is under negotiation with um, with MB as, as uh, for Raupo. So these two are subject to movement at the moment, are not achievable. Uh, while the Dargaval, Tecopolo is in. Uh, is I think it's in a good shape. So we got a month's delay and uh, we're, we're trying to recover that. Um, so again, the program has been discussed before. So any question? No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, Eros. Uh, uh, and so we'll go to Councillor Wilson Collins now for a statement. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Extremely brief statement because we've covered everything already this morning. But just just the the acknowledgement of how far reaching um, this these projects go and and the snapshot is is really good to see every month as a as just the one stop shop of of how we're tracking. So um, so yeah, just thanks again to the team for all the work that they're doing behind the scenes trying to get all these projects over the line. Thank you, thank you, and Councillor Kerno. Um, yeah, just wanting to echo that thanks to the team. We get to this, the end of this agenda and you do have a sense of the enormity of what it is they're, they're, they're delivering on behalf of our communities. So yeah, yeah, thanks to the team and yeah, we hear your frustrations and we feel those frustrations um, and yeah, acknowledge the, the work you're doing to try and mitigate the, those challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further statements from elected members? No further statements at this point. I'm putting the noting of this report to the vote now. All those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Against. Aye. Carried. Thank you. Thank you. So at that point, uh, this brings us to the conclusion of today's agenda for the externally funded projects committee meeting um, thank you everyone for your attendance uh, and uh, like i say the projects are in a very interesting space within the next month uh, we have several grand openings of projects of both of our own and of uh, nrc's as well uh, in kaipara and so uh, it's a very interesting time as autumn rolls on so but at this point uh, I'm going to conclude this meeting uh, for, for myself and hand over to uh, Councillor Kerno uh, to close us out with a karakia. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you, Mayor. Kia tau na mana kitanga a te mea naro. Ki runga ki tēnā ki tēnā o tātou. Ki a mahia, mahia te hua mā kihi kihi. Koi kia toi te kupu, toi te aroha, toi te reo Māori, tihe Māori, tihe Māori ora. Māori ora.